And Ellen, we're now recording, so as soon as we have a critical mass, we can begin. Okay. It looks like there's still, okay, it looks like we're getting back. I think we're good to go. Hey, I was just waiting till it was top of the hour. Oh, okay. Sorry. I forgot. <laughs> I didn't do a time hack here. My bad. <laughs> well, welcome back, everyone, to day two. We're starting this morning with a panel discussion on roadblocks to STEM graduate student retention. I'm grateful to Jerry Richmond, who's chair of our external engagement committee for initiating and orchestrating this discussion. And uh, in fact, for turning engagement with the research community into a standing NSB meeting highlight. So I'll now turn the floor over to Jerry so she can introduce her speakers. Great, thanks, Ellen. Uh, when we started putting this panel together, Ellen immediately sprang to mind as perfect, perfect, perfect person to host it. I'm hearing a little bit of background noise. Does that uh, make sure everyone's muted? Yeah, if we can make sure everyone's muted. Thank you. Great. Okay, so Alan immediately came to mind as someone who could really help us with this panel. As many of you know, he was CEO of American Academy Association of Advancement of Science, AAAS, for 13 years. Uh, evolving it in exciting new directions. He's also served for 12 years on the National Science Board. I had the thrill of uh, serving with him, appointed by President Bush and appointed also reappointed by uh, President Obama. Now, Alan has long thought and written about graduate STEM education and about needed changes, as we'll talk about today, such as the focus of a wider range of skills beyond those needed for graduate research, and he chaired the 2018 National Academies Report on Graduate STEM Education for the 21st Century, which I advocate everyone to read. Alan, we are so pleased to have you back on the board and to host this important panel, so please take it away. You're muted, Alan. <laughs> I'm much more articulate that way. Um, Nice to see everybody. Nice to be with you all. It's sort of like old home week and uh, feels terrific. So welcome everybody to this panel on uh, roadblocks to STEM graduate student retention. My first job is to ask everybody to turn off your camera and mute yourself uh, during the presentations. So so the issue is a, a big one. It, there are a number of disconnects that are plaguing graduate STEM education, the preparation of the future well, workforce at the moment. And I won't go through those in great detail, but the, some of them will come up. Among the biggies is the problem of retention and how do we retain the best and brightest in STEM fields? Whether you think of STEM fields as coming from the skilled technical workers for academic researchers or the number of PhDs who are working in a by now myriad of other sectors. There are many things that uh, NSF can do that the National Science Board can do. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, chairing the report as Jerry pointed out of the National Academies that talked about sort of restructuring graduate STEM education for the 21st century. And uh, I'm delighted to, to point out that uh, two of our speakers today were members of that committee. Uh, the, commi the panelists today are going to focus primarily on the uh, issue of retention. There are, as Jerry said, a number of other interesting and important issues that I think all of you can um, help us work on. The first speaker today is gonna to be Dr. Kenneth Gibbs, who's chief of the undergraduate and predoctoral cross-disciplinary training branch at the National Institutes of Health. He's over 
seen a variety of training programs focused on increasing diversity across educational levels. He was one of the members of our National Academies report. Our second speaker, Renata Garrison Tull, is Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, University of California, Davis. She's a co-author of another Academy of report, a very important one, on the science of effective mentoring in STEM. I recommend that report to everybody. Third panelist will be Suzanne Ortega, who's president of the Council of Graduate Schools. Suzanne has a long history in higher education leadership, including having been a very successful graduate dean herself. Suzanne was also a member of our committee and will speak on broad training needed for graduate students. The final panelist will be Selena Gray, a Blackfeet Métis member and a master's graduate student at the University of Montana's wildlife biology program. She's a policy advocate across multiple digital media platforms for tribal colleges and their students who face financial hurdles. Ms. Gray is going to speak about roadblocks that she and other graduate students have and continue to face. Each panelist is going to speak for five minutes. We'll do them sequentially. And after the panelists uh, have spoken, we'll invite board members to turn their cameras back on and I'll open it up to a Q&A session with the board members. So with that, let's start with uh, Dr. Gibbs. Kenny. Thank you so much, Alan. I'm pleased to be here. If you could um, start the slides, that would be very helpful. Great. Um, so good morning to you all. It's good to be here digitally. I'm Kenny. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit about what we've done at NIGMS to enhance graduate recruitment and retention for a diverse and skilled workforce. For those of you who aren't familiar, NIGMS is the um, basic science component of NIH. And so we focus on just basic research to understand how biology works. We're not really concerned with uh, diseases, body parts, or life stages like the rest of the NIH. Um, and so we're sometimes, for that reason, called the NSF of NIH. Um, um, NIGMS provides leadership in training the next generation of scientists, as well as enhancing diversity in the scientific workforce. And so that means annually we spend about $350 million on over 1,000 research and training and diversity enhancing awards at institutions across the country. And um, one of our motivations is to ensure that everybody has opportunity. And so if we go to the next slide um, to contribute and see what we see, um, and this is some data that the uh, staff helped me pull together, but really thinking about what is representation and how does it change across the science and engineering pathway, right? And so just to orient you, on the bottom we have bachelor's degrees, in the middle master's, and on top doctoral degrees. In orange, we have women. Um, the lighter orange is women from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, so that would be um, Hispanic or Latina, um, American Indian, I mean, sorry, African American, Black, Native American, Alaska Native, Pacific Islander. And, and um, the darker orange, we have women from white or Asian or well-represented backgrounds. And then those similar backgrounds are in, in blue. So what we see, um, if you uh, click next, is that um, we see some differences across training stages. So women as a whole earned the majority of bachelor's degrees in STEM and over 41% of doctorates, which is great in 2016. Um, scientists from historically underrepresented racial and ethnic groups earned about 21% of bachelor's degrees and about 9% of doctorates. But we see, and you all are probably aware, there's a big degree of field variance. And so in life science disciplines and in psychology, which, you know, are often overlapping with the NIH mission, we see um, high representation of women and scientists from historically underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Whereas we see lower representation of those groups in computer sciences, engineering, and physical sciences. So I'm gonna share a little bit about some of the models that we have had as it relates to, again, um, training and um, attracting and retaining a diverse uh, workforce. If you go to the next slide, um, you're gonna see a number of different programs. And so we have programs that span the training pathway from undergrad to grad as well as postdoc and early career faculty. Here I'm focusing on four, um, two that are at the undergraduate stage, the URISE and MARC programs, you can see their full names there, and then two at the graduate or PhD stage, GRISE and IMSD. All these programs focus on community building, mentoring, and skills development um, as it relates to um, enhancing 
retention for students from um, from all backgrounds, in particular those from underrepresented groups, with really the idea of maybe enhancing this to uh, the entire institution. If you click next, some of the mechanisms that we use, um, next please. Okay, thank you. Are we support the trainees for one to three years. And we know that financial support is really important. And so these programs provide tuition remission and stipend. Um, research experiences are critical, particularly at the undergrad stage for um, interest in graduate work, um, as well as seminars, networking, career and development activities, such as going to conferences, having speakers come from a lot of backgrounds so they can have role models. Um, we do cohort building activities because we know that community is key to persisting in science, you need community around you. Um, and we also hope these activities help them to enhance aspects like their science identity, think of themselves as a scientist, as well as their self-efficacy. We also focus on individualized mentoring and oversight throughout the training stage. And so these are some of the programs that we have while uh, students are either in graduate school and at the undergrad level. And just for why we have multiple programs at each stage, the RISE programs focus on research active institutions, which have research activity, but more modest levels. And Mark and IMSD focus on the research intensive institutions because we wanna make sure that we can support students no matter what context they're in. Finally, if you click next, we also know that we can help people who are transitioning. And so there are a large pool of students who have finished their degrees, want to go to graduate school, but want some additional training and development. And so we have a program called PREP, which is our post-baccalaureate research education program. It's an intensive one-year research apprenticeship and skills development program. They spend three quarters of their time in lab, a quarter of their time doing you know, classes or skills development. And importantly, 75% of the participants from this program progress on to biomedical PhD programs. So these are all effective models that we've developed. I'm happy to share more with you or other models. I'm happy now to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Toll. Well, thank you very much, Kenny. Um, so next we have Renata Garrison Toll. Renata, you're on. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you for inviting me to this conversation. In addition to my work with UC Davis, I bring experience from my prior work in graduate education in Maryland, and also the study committee for the National Academy's report on the science of effective mentoring in STEM. Broadening participation in graduate education is a challenge and preparing for recruitment in STEM graduate programs is not enough. We must also consider graduate student retention. So think about your own graduate school experience. The pursuit of a PhD and the journey through graduate school can be incredibly isolating and more so for students from historically marginalized backgrounds where their numbers are few. The mentoring structure will be this focus here and the information that I'm sharing comes from the National Academy's mentoring report and the next few figures from that report also include work from commission papers by Dr. Baronda Montgomery and Dr. Stephanie Page. Next slide, please. The structure for the PhD program often includes a two-person dyadic model consisting of a student plus a faculty advisor. We know this model well. The faculty advisor guides the student through the doctoral research and it is a one-to-one -one apprenticeship model. But obtaining the doctorate takes years and the dyadic model, which gives one person significant power and responsibility over another is far from ideal. The research reveals that this two-person model is not working. The dyadic model relies on building a two-person relationship, which of course can take many forms, but the dyadic model can be limiting and fraught with errors that can slow a student's progression through graduate school or even halt their journey altogether if the relationship fails. The dyadic model itself can be a roadblock. A new paradigm is emerging along with an operational definition for mentoring as follows. Mentorship is a professional working alliance in which individuals work together over time to support the personal and professional growth, development, and success of the relational partners through the provision of career and psychosocial support. Next slide, please. In figure B, triads are the simplest non-dyadic structure, and there are two mentors and one mentee, or one mentor and two mentees. Next slide. Figure C shows collective or group mentorship, which involves multiple mentors or multiple mentees with connections between and among them. Next slide. 
Figure D shows network mentorship, a mentee-centric perspective that shows different mentors, mentoring nodes, for example, groups of mentors, mentoring programs, as well as mentoring resources. And we encourage networks that include faculty and membership in disciplinary specific organizations such as IEEE, the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, along with, and not instead of, affinity-based organizations that provide group mentorship, such as SACNIS, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Hispanics and Native Americans in Science, or NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers. Further, graduate students should be strongly encouraged to freely participate in programs that both mentor them and work to improve departmental structural barriers, such as the National Science Foundation's Alliances for Graduate Education and the Professoriate, or AGEP or the National Institutes of Health IMSD. Let's look at three examples of mentoring programs. First, the Promise AGEP in Maryland led by UMBC includes schools throughout the University of System of Maryland. And here faculty work along with staff in the graduate school and they create meetings as third spaces that encourage egalitarian mentoring across ranks. Networks that include faculty, staff, alumni, career professionals, plus online groups of mentors such as Latinas in STEM and Vanguard STEM. And these networks of people connect to provide graduate students with advice, assist with challenges throughout the career trajectory and celebrate milestones along the way. Second, Meyerhoff Graduate Biomedicals Fellows Program is an NIH IMSD program that includes networks of peer mentors, dissertation advisors, faculty and staff directors, along with generations of alumni, several of whom were members of the undergraduate Meyerhoff program and the NSF's Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation or LSAMP. And third, the newly restructured Promise Engineering Institute between UC Davis and UMBC expands these models and is developing an East-West Alliance for mentors of, inter of engineering programs across California and Maryland, including a formal relationship with the American Society of Engineering Education and connecting internationally to the Latin and Caribbean Consortium of Engineering Institutions. Relationships within these programs include a faculty member, but they also include additional mentorship structures. As an update from the recent events of 2020, it's important to include anti-racism conversations in mentoring. Faculty should find ways to include and not hide from discussions and acknowledgement of identities and cultures. These conversations involve growth, understanding and intentional inclusion and can be incorporated into process oriented mentorship and shared support of the student where the networks can help. Next slide. In closing, the report recommends structures which do the following. Consider the operational definition for mentoring. Use evidence-based approaches to support mentorship, a collaborative learning relationship and working alliance that includes intentionality, trust, and shared responsibility for the interactions. Have a structured feedback system with assessment and evaluation to identify areas of strength and opportunities for improvement. Recognize and respond to identities because they are relevant. Respond to value and build upon the, the power of diversity. Be culturally responsive and move beyond colorblindness, intentionally addressing socio-demographic factors. Support multiple mentorship structures. Reward effective mentorship. Department chairs and institutional leaders should consider mentorship and promotion, tenure, and performance appraisal practices. Mitigate negative mentorship experiences. Structures should be in place for neutral third party point of contact to, in, to identify, I, investigate and address negative mentoring experiences. And then for agencies, integrate mentoring tools and research, support in-depth mentoring for uh, cross-cultural evaluation and research related to outcomes of mentorship, particularly with regard to students from communities that have been historically marginalized. Effective mentorship is associated with positive mentorship Menti outcomes, and it involves intentionality, and it is, a, it is a developed skill. Mentees and mentors should be supported by institutional changes that examine the structures and deliberately remove the roadblocks. Thank you for your attention to these remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Renetta. That, that was terrific. Uh, there are a lot of things to think about in that short presentation. Uh, let's turn to Suzanne Ortega. Suzanne. Thank you colleagues for this opportunity to present some high level findings from recent studies that I hope will both intrigue and provoke your thinking. 
Um, throughout the slides, there will be hot links that give you an opportunity to find out more about study details as you're interested. Next. I'd like to begin with a quick recognition of the funders of the uh, studies that I will be speaking to from and to and the PIs responsible for them. Next. For decades, surveys such as SED and SDR have indicated that the majority of scientists and engineers are employed outside of the academy. But here I want to focus on career transitions, their frequency, direction, and the skill sets necessary for negotiating them. Next. As you can see, there is significant movement into new jobs at all career stages. From our data, we know that most of these transitions are within sector. However, up to a third of them involve switch changes between sectors. And those changes are not unidirectional. A non-trivial minority of each of these cohorts move from business government and nonprofits to the academy. And when they do so, it is primarily into faculty roles. Next. Well, BG BGN employment and job change are not new. It is clear that the pandemic and anti-Blackness may be amplifying them. Results from recent studies suggest that the career aspirations of current STEM students are changing with a decreased interest in academic jobs and an increase in non-academic jobs. And this is particularly pronounced for uh, students of color and those from first generation low income groups. This of course constitutes a real challenge to our efforts to diversify the faculty. But evidence from our career transition slide suggests a possible path forward if we are smart enough to anticipate, chart, and enable multiple on-ramps at, at different points in time to the faculty role. Next. The good news is that the skill sets necessary to function across sectors are far more similar than they are different. Results from studies indicate, for example, that initiative analytic thinking, integrity, innovation, and flexibility are equally important across sectors. And as you can see here, the vast majority of alumni also say that skills ranging from communication to multicultural competence are extremely important to their success in their current jobs. Yet, despite this keen awareness, a much smaller proportion of our respondents report that they actually availed themselves of professional development offerings while in school. Primary reason, they didn't know it was offered or it wasn't offered. And since we know that most major research universities have a rich suite of professional development offerings, it suggests that we need to make both students and their faculty mentors more deeply aware of them. I do want to briefly note that we will get better at professional development, but that it alone is likely to be insufficient to promote the kinds of skills we need. And I would sec suggest that we turn again to piloting some of the innovations suggested in the 2018 Academy's report about different modes of capstone project. Well, here I want to shift gears next to explore the linkage between career aspirations, perceived career prospects, and first, the undergraduate graduate pathway, and then secondarily, graduate student mental health and well-being. Although most remain committed to eventually attending graduate school, about eight in 10 undergraduate research program participants indicate that they are either now less likely or more deeply uncertain about going to graduate school immediately following the baccalaureate. And I would point out the difference is far more pronounced for women than for men. The reasons appear to be concerns about their own health or that of family members, financial concerns, including job loss, again, of family and self, caregiving burdens, and once again, career uncertainty. And finally, next, anti-Blackness is compounding the economic and health consequences of the pandemic and aggravating graduate student mental health. It's really shocking to me that Ogilvy et al's study found that nearly one third of current graduate students report symptoms consistent with PTSD or clinically significant levels of anxiety and depression. 
And this means that COVID will have a long tail and require us to rethink student support services and pedagogies. So what are the implications of these five data points? Well, first career uncertainty disrupts education and creates stress. Possible solution is building IDP requirements into training grants, traineeships, postdoctoral training and fellowships. Um, we need to revisit leave of absence policies and other policies about uh, satisfactory progress. Second, so long as we implicitly value only the kind of science produced in traditional formats to wit the way we demonstrate impact to NSF or for recognition for professional honors is the coin of the realm, the peer reviewed journal article. We send a message counter to that of career diversity. We should invest in research policy and practices that encourage new scientific formats and modes. And finally, invest in students. Finances are a huge concern. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne. And uh, we're going to turn now to our final formal speaker, Selena Gray. Uh, Selena, please. Oki Itomic Skinatoni Niraniko na Selena Gray Nisto Amskapi Pikaniaki Miti. I wanted to start by formally introducing myself in my Blackfeet language. I am speaking to you today from the traditional territory of not only my ancestors, but also the Confederated Salish Kootenai and Ponderay tribal lands of Missoula, Montana. Three things really affected my path to graduate school. Uh, first of all, I chose Salish Kootenai College, a small tribal college in Montana to pursue my bachelor's at. Um, after the birth of my twins, I needed the support of my culture and community. Secondly, I had previous research experience under my belt and received more training because of that. And lastly, I had a couple different mentors that helped me find and pursue the right resources for me, like family-friendly research experiences, including some of the more recognizable accolades I've received, like the Udall Scholarship and the GRFP. But pursuing graduate school was a big decision for myself and my family. I had a hard time choosing where to go next. I've never really had someone telling me exactly what I needed to do to get into graduate school or even what to expect when I got here. I was being recruited by a law program in Arizona, but wasn't sure if my family could handle moving so far away from our support system here in the greater Northwest. I utilized prep classes for graduate school and they helped open my eyes to what schools could support me. I was put onto these programs by my mentors and advisor and these prep programs were NSF funded and ultimately got me into the top wildlife program in the nation here at the University of Montana. Mentorship has been vital to my own success and many of my peers just weren't exposed to it like I was. So in some cases, it was up to me to share the resources and knowledge that I had and bring my peers along with me. And that's the case with my current cohort here at the University of Montana. Over the past three years, the UM Wildlife Program has grown from maybe having one native student in the program to now having seven pursuing both masters and PhDs because of the connection to my tribal college, SKC, and to professional development programs focused on diversity within the Wildlife Society and the Ecological Society of America. I am also a member of SACNIS and have mentored other students in an effort to give back some of the experiences that I have had. I mentioned these professional development programs because that's the kind of thing that makes the difference for Native students. It's exposure and beyond exposure is experience. Coming from a tribal college, access to extended education can be a difficult mold to break, even though students are in a supportive environment culturally. For me personally, when I started grad school at the University of Montana, I started off not knowing who was going to be my advisor or really what I wanted to do as a thesis. Transitioning from a reservation community to being an urban Indian was an additional culture shock beyond just my program itself. My cost of living rose by 200% and I had entered graduate school with a family and was pregnant with our third, which immediately set me apart socially. 
this year I have an extra job and my husband stays at home with the kids. So some of these challenges have ironed themselves out and some haven't, especially during COVID. I will be taking an extra year to finish and that's the reality for many native students like myself. I am excited to start my research this summer, but because of how COVID has affected and disrupted my tribal community partners, that might change drastically. Extra support for graduate students like myself is needed both socially and financially because of this. And I would say focusing on the examples given by the, at the tribal college level could have the biggest impact for both recruitment and retention. So I really hope you all on the board consider expanding and supporting tribal colleges and universities that are helping them build capacity and strengthening their programs through NSF programs like the TCUP program. This could lead to better success rates and retentions for students like myself that do take longer. Um, I'd like to end by saying thank you for taking the time to listen today and I'd be happy and I'm sure all of the panelists would be happy to answer any questions you might have for us. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Selena. And thank you to all of the panelists. I think these were very stimulating and provocative presentations with lots of messages to the National Science Board, the NSF, and to all of us to think about a problem that is persistent forever. We've trained graduate students in the same way for 100 years, and it's time to modernize and to uh, restructure it. So um, we're going to turn to to the Q&A session, and I'll ask the science board members to turn on their videos, raise your virtual hand when, when you want to ask a question, and I'm going to give Jerry Richmond the first shot at the question. I'd ask everybody to keep the questions short. We'll keep the answers short. So, Jerry. Well, first, I just uh, just applaud all speakers who've just done a fabulous job, uh, just fabulous. I just want to make a, a quick comment when we get the questions prepared. And that is, as you know, many of the board members know I've been pushing really hard for us to get some information about retention of graduate students, and particularly, for example, to have those institutions supported by NSF funds to have to report and make public their retention rate of graduate students. And I'm happy to announce that there is some a group that's been doing this for the last number of years, just a bit of a pilot program. So I put your attention to the Next Generation of Life Sciences Coalition, run by a couple of uh, universities, and uh, they've got this started. And so places like Michigan Tech and MIT, they've worked out the details so that all the reporting is there. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them uh, because I think they can, they've set up a model that NSF could follow. So with that, let me turn it over then to questions. Let's start with you, you get the first shot. So I think, um, uh, Selena, uh, you inspire us all. Um, how do you think, uh, in particular, we can help with, with students that have uh, children? Because we don't want to make it seem like you need to go into celibacy in order to go to graduate school. How can we be more helpful to, to, to people that have families to come back to graduate school and stay in graduate school? Um, I would say that the most valuable experiences that I had were within labs and um, research experiences that included different ways to be flexible for just the family atmosphere. Um, and there were, there was an ease of access to things like childcare um, that was built into like orientation programs so that my children could be close by and I could also be participating, but close if my children needed me. Um, and also just, you know, regular kind of community building activities that included my husband as well, um, you know, so that there was a, a sense of inclusion for not just myself and my children, but also my entire family as a whole. Great, thanks, Selena. Great, thank you. So uh, I have Two more on my list. One is Victor and then Ellen Chalk. So Victor first. Thank you, Alan. Um, and uh, thank you, panel. Incredible. Uh, my uh, question is directed toward uh, Dr. Kenny Gibbs. Um, great presentation. 
Uh, if you're familiar with the program at NIH, the BUILD program that started back in about 2014, uh, what's your thoughts on the BUILD program, lessons learned, and uh, something that we could maybe look at here at NSF? Yes, and so for those who aren't familiar, BUILD stands for Building Infrastructure Leading to Diversity. It's a common fund effort, meaning it's a 10-year experiment um, and that's managed actually by NIGMS in my branch. And what the program does is that it targets schools that um, have a diverse population and they came up with different experiments around how to enhance training at the student level, faculty development, as well as institutional capacity building for additional research activity, right? And so those are across the country. I think we're learning some different things and um, I am happy to sort of send some additional resources uh, to the committee, but you know, there are models that we've seen, for example, in um, University of Alaska, they use this One Health model to um, really integrate, I think, indigenous perspectives and holistic perspectives into health research. There have been entrepreneurial models at Morgan State University to really help students take agency there. So I think we're learning um, there's no one way to do this. There are lots of ways, there's lots of potential. And if we have a holistic effort that focuses not just on the students, but those who are, those who are leading them in the context in which we are, you can have some really um, strong impacts. Hope that answers the question at a high level. Oh, right, something specific. You did. I think also in more important is also the commitment in terms of, of dollars. It's a big program. Yeah. And so these tends to be um, the largest grants that these institutions have, and they've been able to leverage them, particularly senior leadership, to, to get um, additional resources there. Um, but yeah, there, there are significant grants. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like 50 million per institution for over 10 years. Um, it's 50 million per year. So it's about yeah. 5 million per institution. That's right. Per, per year. For 10, yeah, yeah. So 50 million over 10 years. Thanks. Okay. We're going to go to Ellen and Joan. Thank you. Uh, I actually have two questions. I'm a little greedy, but hopefully they'll both be short. Uh, one's for Renetta. And one of the things you mentioned was about rewarding effective mentorship. And I was wondering if you um, knew of an example where an academic institution uh, did that and particularly where it counts, you know, in, in a tenure or promotion decision and what information they may have collected to be able to consider that um, mm -hmm. in their decision. And then a question for Selena, you mentioned you were a member of SACNIS and uh, I often suggest that students, you know, look for these student chapters of organizations like that, because I, I do think it can provide a lot of support. And I was curious when you were able to get involved in that, whether it was as an undergrad and, and maybe helped with your graduate student um, decision or something that you found in graduate school. So I'll turn first to Renetta. Okay. Thank you for your question. So there are a number of mentoring awards that are given by um, different discipline specific societies and organizations. And so um, when departments encourage their faculty to apply for those awards, and many times they require letters of validation from students um, past and present, then that can help also internal awards that the university provides, whether at the department level or the institutional level, those things um, can often come with a monetary award, some kind of academic enrichment fund um, where the faculty member can use those funds for conferences to support other students to fund other projects and those kinds of things. In some cases, there are financial awards that the um, faculty member can use in, in any way that they see fit. And so sometimes I, I would say that um, having these kinds of awards that are at the local level as well as at the national and international level and then allowing those to be counted in tenure and promotion um, are ways to definitely um, reward effective mentorship. There are also mentorship scales. Many of those are outlined in the report by the National Academies and again they include a, a multifold process because the mentor has to um, report but the mentees also have a chance to um, provide feedback and, and those kinds of things should count in a, a variety of different kinds of ways. Great, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, Selena, and then I just wanna warn everybody, I've got six more people on my list who wanna ask questions, short questions, short answers. Okay, Selena. Uh, so my participation in SACNIS really began um, 
towards the end of my undergraduate career um, and has kept on going into my graduate career. Um, I was more involved with the Native Student Professional Development Program of the Wildlife Society and also the SEEDS program, which is under the Ecological Society of America. I believe it stands for um, strategies, strategies for Education and um, Ecology and Diversity and Sustainability. Um, and those programs have really um, meant a lot to me and helped me build community going into graduate school. Thank you. Great. Okay, Stephen Willard. You have to unmute, Steve. As part of my work on NSF, I went with Victor McCrary to some historically black colleges and universities and was amazed that although they've lived with very few resources, they've developed an incredible capacity for mentoring. Some of the finest mentoring I think could be done. And I would suggest that as papers are written and whatever, we go and study the mentoring programs at the HSBCUs. That will actually be, Stephen, that will actually be part of our May meeting. Oh, excellent. Okay, uh, Dan Reed. Thanks, Alan. I was actually in one of the meetings when you presented the uh, the uh, Academy's report, and I was kind of struck by the faculty reaction of, uh, in terms of change and, and rebalancing power structures. Uh, and so one of my questions for the panel really is, you know, what, from your perspective, would help maybe address some of this imbalance of power, which I think contributes to frankly, sometimes the less than conducive mentoring experience that students have. Okay, uh, Renetta, do you wanna start? Because uh, that's in the yes. domain of that report you were on. Yes, so very quickly between that report and also um, the CGS PhD completion project, we found that um, when graduate students are trained in these different kinds of programs that have multiple mentoring structures, then they themselves, when they become faculty members, also invoke multiple uh, mentorship structures. And so uh, graduate training is one of those kinds of things, but also if the departments and again, the institutions um, would promote multiple mentorship structures and not see it as a territorial one-to-one -one kind of model, then that can definitely help with moving things forward and balancing the power. Okay. I'm going to take the liberty of the moderator. We only have five minutes left, so I'm not going to let any other panelists answer Dan's the excellent question. Uh, Suresh B, and then I think we're getting close. Hello, uh, Selena. Um, that was uh, hard work and everything to get to this point. So looking back at it, is there any need for SNT infrastructure in your community where a lot more people like you to get uh, get to this level? So, is there any recommendations to us as a part of science and technology infrastructure? Selena, right. so, so nice. okay. Yeah, I I would definitely say that tribal communities um, need capacity building in general um, and access to science and technology. Um, quite often. Tribal colleges are the only place that you can access um, consistent Wi-Fi. And so, and the, we see the effects of that throughout the pandemic where even our high schoolers are having to sit in the parking lot of tribal colleges because that's the only place where the Wi-Fi is consistent enough. And also just um, a lot of tribal communities are rural. And so the effects on rural communities are also a lot of the effects that are just affecting Indian country as a whole. Um, but there's also, you know, the, the balance of power, I would say, is um, definitely something that also affects students very early on. And so um, teachers taking an interest in their students and, um, and also just the science community in general, reaching out and making sure that everybody has access to science, you know, um, is really important for tribal communities and students that are moving up from, you know, high school to college and then also on to graduate school and PhD programs. And so. Great. Thank you very much, Selena. 
Okay, last question goes to uh, Punch. Uh, he gets to ask a short question and get a short answer. Uh, I would encourage people to put their remaining questions in the chat and we'll try to get them. Punch. Un unmute. That was clear. Um, Punch, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Sorry, I, I, I had some difficulty here. So I'm just getting said sorry about that. I, I wanted to say that it was a very impressive panel. Jerry, again, you did it. So we are going to have every meeting now for you to put a panel together. It's a fantastic panel. Um, staff, you know, NFA staff, OK? <laughs> yes, staff too, staff too, yes. I need to, all, everything needs a leader. So thank you so much. And um, you know, every one of those comments, my question was answered. In fact, that's why I brought the question down. But I wanted to congratulate Selena. Selena, this is phenomenal. You're just an inspiration in terms of how you've navigated to this. The question I had also is, you know, you've got an amazing president uh, in uh, Warrior Cusado. She's, she's, she's an amazing uh, person in terms of a leader of a, of a university. And so how much does the university provide support in this? Because you said, as you moved in here, what is the university component support that you think that, because I think we, there are many university leaders here that I can assure you, NSF will do everything, um, you know, to make sure that we are helpful and supportive, uh, not only in the COVID situation, but even beyond COVID. Uh, COVID is only teaching us lessons of what we can do better. And so we will continue to persist and do that from NSF's perspective. But in addition to that, I was gonna ask what, uh, if any lessons that you could uh, impart in, in a very brief way from the university perspective. Suzanne, do you wanna, you don't wanna answer that? Um, who would like to answer that? Um, I can jump in. Uh, from a student perspective, I had one person here at the university who um, is also a master's student herself and working dually as a staff here at the university that knew the ins and outs of um, things that new students need to know. Um, quite often, master's students uh, come from other places and so they don't know the the lay of the land and need to know a lot of things like financial aid, housing, um, other, you know, just day-to-day -day business that students have to keep track of. And so the university is supporting positions like that, that um, are really just for the student as a resource um, is really important. And I know that sometimes her position has been temporary. And so just like cementing the fact that diverse students need these support systems on a continuous basis is really important for retention and also recruitment. Um, there's somebody that can be vital to someone's success. So let me make one more comment uh, before I close us. Uh, just to answer Punch's question, there is something that both universities can do and government agencies can do. You all control the incentive system. If you don't change the incentive system, nothing's gonna change. So NSF controls how you review grants, what you mentioned in announcements. If you say we need better mentoring, you're gonna get better mentoring. Uh, you know, it, it, people follow the money as we say. Uh, with that, let me thank our fabulous panel. I think it was a great conversation. It's clear that there is much to be done. I want to second Jerry's comment about the staff because I have never seen as good staff. I miss it now that I'm unemployed. Um, I miss having that kind of staff backup. So thank you, everybody, and thank you for the conversation. Thanks for the invitation to come. And we'll turn it over to Ellen. All right, thank you. And, and to Alan and uh, Kenny, Renetta, Suzanne and Selena, thank you so much for your time. The data that you brought, the call to action to all of us. I hope we can continue to engage with you as we move forward with our own issues on this, um, our own efforts on this critical issue. I'm sorry, we didn't quite get to all the questions. Matt, I saw your hand up and, <laughs> um, but I hope we can uh, continue on as we uh, develop this. So thanks for a rich discussion. We will move on now to the open session of Committee on Strategy and Suresh, I'll turn it over to you.
Thank you very much, Alan. Um, <laughs> I didn't get a chance to raise my hand, so I'll just congratulate the previous panel as well because I've got the mic. Uh, just wonderful. And I have more thoughts about that we can discuss uh, separately. So welcome everyone to the open meeting of the National Science Board Committee on Strategy. My name is Suresh Garamella and I chair the committee. Uh, committee members are Vice Chair Heather Wilson, Roger Beachy, Dario Gill, Mel Huff, Matt Malkin, Emilio Moran, Dan Reed, Alan Stern, and Steve Willard. In tab 13 of the board book, you'll find a brief background memo which outlines the purpose of today's session and what we're trying to accomplish. Our agenda covers several topics of particular relevance to Vision 2030's delivering benefits from research and developing STEM talent goals. They include strengthening foundational research, translation and innovation activities, the missing millions, and the budget. The briefings we'll receive and subsequent discussions on these topics will lead us into our final discussion, which is on NSF's next strategic plan. As indicated on the agenda, at about 1.05 p.m., after the translation and innovation item, we'll take a 10-minute break and then resume at 1.15 for the missing millions and strategic plan discussions. Moving on to uh, the minutes, at this time, I ask for formal approval by the Committee on Strategy members of the minutes from the committee's open session at the December 10th, 2020 NSB meeting and the open teleconference on February 8th, 2021. The minutes are also in tab 13 of diligent board book. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Hearing none and not waiting too long. Um, with no objections, the minutes uh, are stand, uh, as, as written or approved. Um, we'll move to the an update on the budget now. So NSF's budget director, Caitlin Fife, will provide an update. Before Caitlin begins, Punch, would you like to make any introductory remarks? Uh, thank you very much, Suresh. I think um, uh, we, we are keen to present the uh, FY21 budget and Caitlin will tell you that just as of last evening, uh, we got the OMB uh, approval. So we'll be able to share more than what we had originally thought that, uh, that we might be able to and then we have to submit to Congress, of course, as the next step. So um, Caitlin is our budget director and has, has been doing a great job navigating all the uh, complexities associated with, um, you know, uh, the, 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 ch the changes and the delays that are there uh, all in a good way. So thank you so much. Over to you, Caitlin. Thank you, Panch. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Um, my update is quite short today. Um, but we do have some important updates since the last time I talked to you in December. So what I would first like to be talking about is updating you on the budget process and where we are. This is a, uh, a bit of an um, odd year or untraditional year, given that we are navigating a presidential administration transition. Um, and so I'll touch on that briefly and then we'll go into the what uh, was it provided for NSF in 2021. So here is where we are um, for the budget, the FY 2022 budget. Um, we submitted as we normally do back in September, our request for 2022. And since then until now, we've been negotiating with, the, um, with our colleagues at OMB and folks in OSTP and other parts of the White House. And as we have heard, and if you've probably seen reported in the news, um, normally by now when I'd be coming to speak with you, the budget would have been released in early February. Um, but because of the change uh, in administration that's delayed, that's common uh, when we have these sorts of presidential transitions. Um, and we expect that the budget will be released in the spring of 2021. As for the FY 2021 current year update, um, as I mentioned, since we last spoke, Congress provided us our full year appropriation, which is great news for NSF. And again, we have a historic funding level higher than we have ever been funded before at 8.5 million. That's a real increase of 208 above where we were in the amount of resources we had available to us in 2020. And it's a significant increase, nearly 750 million compared to what was requested in the budget, the president's budget request um, last year. What you will see here are some of uh, the account by account totals. Um, and as Ponch mentioned, uh, we 
after the bill is passed, we are required to submit to uh, Congress with the approval of OMB, a congressional uh, a detailed spending plan. And so we have reached a critical milestone of, of getting agreement with the administration and will hopefully shortly be transmitting to Congress for their consideration. So what's included in that plan that we have, um, we have been given uh, by, that will be going to Congress? So first and foremost, um, we follow the congressional guidance. Uh, it is not, all of the funding is not left to NSF to decide how to spend. Um, we have pretty explicit direction in the reports that accompany the various appropriations bills. And we look at those very closely to make sure we are adhering to them. Um, so some areas that may be of interest to folks is quantum information science. There was specific direction of what we call a floor so that we are to invest no less than 210 million. And we had endorsement that we could spend all the way up to what we had requested for AI. And they also encouraged us um, to support our efforts in the AI workforce um, with uh, uh, minority serving institutions um, such as HBCUs, HSI, tribal colleges and universities, which after the last discussion we had, we can see will be put to um, very good use. So, um, and I also know that Fleming is going to be, uh, there, that there are some other conversations that the board may be hearing about that will go into more detail about how NSF is spending those resources. Um, racial equity is a large, is a high priority in the Build Back Better plan. And um, when we're able to talk about that in more detail, you will be pleased to see that NSF is stepping up and taking our role in that quite seriously. Um, in addition, the Education and Human Resources, that's both a budget account and a directorate for NSF. And so that's why they're called out here specifically. And they saw a, a 3.1% increase above the 2020 plan. And this is also the area where we, see, we do tend to see the most congressional direction because that's where a lot of the, the programs that target specific populations do reside. However, the support of various underrepresented groups um, do exist all across NSF. So I wanna make sure that people don't just look to, e to EHR for where we're investing because some of the really exciting work um, is happening kind of across the foundation. And then also Congress notes the importance to continue the um, support for the facility operations transition pilot, which is something that NSF undertook after some recommendations that came to the board on the operations and maintenance. One thing I just did wanted to show folks is a little bit of historical context. You know, sometimes what I've heard um, from the committee before is, Caitlin, don't just be looking at just one year ahead or, or, or one month back, but kind of take a broader view. And so what we wanted to do here is, is plot, at least give you a sense of where NSF has been and what the agency has been um, experiencing over the past decade when it comes to our budget. So this first bar just shows you that steady increase that we've been, we've been saying, which again, when we talk about that NSF receives bipartisan support, this is the type of thing that happens to have sustained investment over a decade that is showing increases um, is no small feat. It speaks to, to that, 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 that this is some of the data we have to kind of back up that claim that we like to make. Uh, I will then also show here's when you look at the percentage change um, added on top of that of how much NSF has gotten from year to year. Um, I will point out for those of you who aren't, um, whose budget hasn't been around the budget for quite some time, 2013 was an anomaly because of something called sequestration. So uh, we included it for completeness sake, but yes, it is a pretty significant outlier in telling this story. And that is all I have for the group today and look forward to being able to share more on the details um, when I come back to you in May. Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, either from the committee or the board members. I'll ask a quick one, if you can, uh, Caitlin, uh, looking at that last chart, uh, you know, I, I suspect there's about a 20% inflation increase over that time, and it seems about 20% of an increase since, say, you know, 7 million in 2011 or so, or 2012. Yeah. So we're 
kind of keeping up with inflation, would you say, or, or are we expecting to exceed inflation? I don't mean next year when Punch will double everything, but um, so far. Yes, yeah, so that's a question that we um, have gotten. And I would say we've tried to answer it quantitatively several times, um, but I don't know that that is as helpful as when we get some of the, you know, the experience of people who are actually doing the research telling us that it is more expensive and it's taking, um, and we're not able to do as much with what you have provided. Um, you know, there's been questions, you can look at it academically about, you know, is, should we be using, what, what price index should we be looking at? You know, is this, you know, what, what are the main driving factors? And I think um, we're anxious to take a deeper dive into that. I know there are other agencies that um, create their own price indexes for how much research costs to do there. Um, but I think for us, we continually hear from the community about how, um, there is a need for us to take a look at um, making sure that we are keeping up with inflation and the cost of doing research. And I think I'm very hopeful that we will be able to, um, to look at that going forward as we realize Poncha's vision of, of expanding NSF's budget significantly beyond these single digit percentages I'm plotting here. Yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. And I think um, definitely the, uh, the regulatory burden on universities and on PIs has increased a lot too, in addition to the just the expense of the research. So it'd be interesting to see how this matches up. Um, I don't believe we're seeing uh, any hands. So, and we've got like a couple of minutes. If you don't mind, I'll ask one more. And that is perhaps um, a chance for you and or Punch to talk about how these budgets support the Vision 2030 goals and or Punch's vision. Maybe it would be helpful for everyone to hear that. I know Panch will want to take that, so I'll leave it to him. Thank you, Caitlin, uh, and thank you, Suresh, for asking that question. As you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, we are we are prioritizing the four pillars of the administration, which aligns with the vision that I presented yesterday in the open session, plenary open, in terms of how the vision of NSF, the vision of 2030, as well as administration pillars are all very aligned. So uh, we are we are we are making sure that we are investing in COVID-19 priority right now, because this is something that the community out there is really hurting. And we need to make sure that scientific community feels supported and that they are given all the support that we can potentially give to make sure that they're able to advance their ideas and the talent that is there has to be advanced. And this is the future of our nation. And so that's the highest priority for us. And so you will hear in a later session where uh, Fleming Krim, uh, the chief operating officer will present uh, what we have done on that regard. So that's one mapping. The other mappings in terms of the priorities of the administration are racial equity. Again, you will find that we are emphasizing the need for broadening the talent, broadening the talent and making sure that uh, you know, it is accessible uh, and, and affordable and things of that nature are things that we emphasize a lot. And so through our programs to see how we can increase accessibility and ensure the talent everywhere has a chance to bloom. And so this is something that we will be spending a lot of effort. We're already doing it in this current environment and we're hoping to do even more into the future. The third priority being the economic recovery. As you know, Caitlin mentioned, the industries of tomorrow and the kinds of investments that we're making in AI, quantum, you know, uh, 5G and the next generation of wireless, advanced manufacturing, synthetic biology and the biotechnology outcomes from that and a host of other things I can go on talking about in the interest of time, you will know that the NSF is making every effort to ensure that through the National AI Institutes or the National Quantum Institutes or the Engineering Research Centers, Science and Technology Centers, I can go on, that we are ensuring that we are contributing to the economic recovery of our nation. This is very, very important. NSF has always done that. We're gonna do strengthen at speed and scale even more. And the fourth pillar on climate change is something that NSF, as you all know in the board, that NSF has always emphasized the importance of understanding the scientific basis for climate change and also what we can do in terms of building more resilient futures. And so we are putting a lot of emphasis in the current budget in terms of the resilient programs that we're also putting together in, in addition to you know, strengthening the climate change understanding as well as what we might do with that. Uh, and so uh, all the four priorities of the administration perfectly align with the vision of NSF that we have laid for the future, perfectly align with the 2030 vision. So you can be rest assured that we will be strengthening at speed and scale. You'll be tired of hearing this term, Suresh and the board, uh, but that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna double down, triple down, quadruple down because this is important times for our nation to be globally competitive and to make sure that all our talent and ideas in our nation 
or given its fullest, fullest support to be able to bring them out. Thank you. I can tell you I won't be tired of hearing that. So please keep, keep doing it. There is one quick question that came in on the chat. I know we have only a couple of minutes, but if you want to take that quickly, Punch or, or Caitlin, um, Aaron Dominguez asks, uh, if the Endless Frontiers Act becomes law, how will it affect the NSF's budgeting process? Sure, so from a process perspective, it really just adds another dimension um, and allows us to really expand the horizon for what um, NSF's impact is going to be, allowing us to um, make commitments and have a steady flow of funds coming over a longer period of time. And so I think that's one really important way, um, especially that I think this committee will be interested in, in setting a strategic vision and then having the funds and certainty to carry that out over several years. I don't know if you have. If you no, have. I just want to underscore that we don't comment on any pending legislation. I just want to be very clear about this. That, so I will not comment as director on a pending legislation because that's not appropriate for me to do. But having said that, the concept is, is indeed something that aligns with the 2030 vision, aligns with the NSA vision, aligns with the administration priorities. So we are looking forward to better futures. That's all I would say. Thank you so much. Yeah, I understand a uh, bunch that makes sense. Um, so we'll, uh, Artie has the last question and the question and answer should take about a minute. Uh, this is just clarification. Isn't the Endless Frontier Act an authorization act rather than an appropriation act? So in fact, it carries no money with it. That's correct, Artie. Good, good clarification, Artie. Um, big gulf between those two things. So we'll now move on to the next uh, piece. Thank you very much, Caitlin, sorry, and, uh, and uh, Punch for the previous uh, session. We'll move on um, to Fleming Crin, NSF's Chief Oper Operating Officer, uh, who will lead our next presentation, which is on strengthening foundational research. And again, before Fleming begins, Punch, uh, do you have a few words of introduction? Thank you very much again for the opportunity to do this. As you know, when I laid out the vision in the September retreat, we talked about three things, strengthening the foundational research, emphasizing translation innovation partnerships, as well as the missing millions. You all had a chance in the December meeting to hear about the missing millions and the translation innovation partnership, early, early thoughts and ideas. You're gonna to continue to hear that today also. This is gonna be an ongoing thing as we unveil more and more and more ideas and get your feedback and thoughts. So this is the first we're getting a chance on the foundational research. So I just want to draw, the, draw, draw, draw to all your attention that this will be an ongoing set of dialogues, not just one time we say something and that's the end of it, because strategy is always evolving, as I've always said. So with that note, over to Chief Operation Officer uh, Fleming Crum. Well, thanks very much, Ponch. Uh, as the director just said, we have been talking to you about discussions that we've been having during the six, last six months since the director arrived, in which we have talked about missing millions, translation innovation partnerships. Today, I'm going to talk about the fourth of those topics, fostering discoverers, discoveries and discoverers. Now that's also known as strengthening the core. Um, I'm going to, try to suppress that term of the core a little bit because it carries some baggage, but that's in fact what we're going to talk about to a, uh, to a certain degree. Well, I'm sorry, that's what we're gonna talk about. So what about the core? Uh, oh, let me go back and say one other thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of information that Matt Wilson was absolutely critical in collecting and uh, 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 synthesizing and, uh, and refining. So uh, Matt has, is really a very important player in the sort of information I want to give you today. So what about the core? How do we start to explore the idea of further enhancing, enhancing our ability to foster discoveries and discoverers? Uh, well, Matt went and talked with each of the senior leaders about what did the word core mean to them and how do we think about it at, uh, at NSF. Then all of us got together, uh, looked at his analysis. He uh, participated with us in going through the analysis he had done and collecting some thoughts about what we mean when we talk about the core. 
here are a few of the things that folks had to say. The core, the way we foster discoveries and discoverers is investigator or community initiated research. It's driven by curiosity. It's basic or fundamental. It responds to continuing programs and it is constantly evolving at the frontiers of discovery. Now, those two bullets are not in conflict. What we fund in biology today is called biology, but it's really different than what we were funding 20 years ago. So continuing programs are constantly evolving. That's a hallmark of what we try to do. But the one collective idea that was most important is that this core mission of NSF is a defining characteristic of NSF. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk to you briefly about a notion that I think many of you are familiar with. This is, grows out of a book that Donald Stokes wrote over thir about 30 years ago called Pasteur's Quadrant. Now, what he did was he plotted scientific endeavor on a, uh, a, in a plane one axis was consideration of use. The other axis was quest for fundamental understanding. There's a perpendicular axis, an orthogonal axis that I'm going to come back to, but I want you to uh, realize that there is that axis. So let's look at this plane that he plotted. He said in the upper left-hand corner where quest for fundamental understanding dominates, we're talking about pure basic research. And in the lower right-hand quadrant, where use, consideration of use dominates, we're talking about pure applied research. And in the upper right-hand corner, we're talking about use-inspired basic research. Now, he identified each of these quadrants with an icon of science. He called pure basic research Bohr's quadrant, pure applied research Edison's quadrant, and use inspired basic research, Pasteur's Quadrant, the name, the title of the book. I was talking with a colleague here at NSF about this a number of years ago, and she said, you know, Fleming, we could be more inclusive at NSF. So I, she proposed, and I agree, we could perhaps call this Curie's Quadrant, and perhaps call the Pure Applied Research Quadrant, Carver's Quadrant. Well, whatever you call them, I want us to think about how they relate to NSF. Pure basic research and use-inspired uh, basic research are the things that NSF funds well. It, is, it has been our inspiration for 70 years, and it's a field that we play in. It's one strand of the DNA you hear the director talking about. Matt and I were talking about it's one member of a uh, pair of dancers, okay? That other axis that I want to talk about for a minute is the translation and innovation axis. Now, pure basic research leads to transformations that move out along that axis. Use-inspired basic research leads to transformations that move out along that axis. Let me very quickly mention a couple of examples. Fundamental research on thermophiles in the geysers in Yellowstone led to the critical discovery that led to that, that is the heart of the polymerase chain reaction. PCR is something you hear about every day in COVID tests, but it's much more than that. It is a true workhorse of, uh, it's a true workhorse of the, um, uh, of much biomedical and biological research. Fundamental research on fluorescence in jellyfish led to the discovery of green fluorescent protein, which has transformed biophysics and much of biology and, uh, um, and chemistry research. Now, use-inspired research is all poised to move out along this translation and innovation axis uh, very quickly. Uh, <laughs> let me mention two quick examples, two brief examples. Think about 3D printing, which our engineering directorate started funding in the 80s. Additive manufacturing is at the heart of much modern manufacturing now. 
Yesterday, the director mentioned to you the story that so many of us know about the digital library, some use-inspired basic research leading to Google. There are a lot of examples like this. And in fact, the president's science advisor, Eric Lander, who's the nominee to lead the Office of Science and Technology Policy, gave a talk in 2015 at the mathematics conference called The Miracle Machine. I recommend you go take a look at it. <clears throat> it is just full of examples like this persuasively discussed. So this other axis, this axis of translation innovation is the other strand of the DNA that you heard the director talking about. It's the other dance partner uh, along with our curiosity driven discovery research. So how do we foster discoveries and discoverers as NSF grows and evolves? evolves? How do we have our dance partner, our two chains, two strands of DNA uh, uh, work together properly? Discovery research is central to the NSF mission and it is, keeps the NSF working at the frontiers of knowledge. Here are a few examples of fostering this, uh, of, uh, of the fundamental research we've supported. A number of you have seen this first image from DKIS that shows you these uh, cells resolved uh, with adaptive optics that are the size of, of Texas. This beautiful blue compound is the result of some research uh, 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 from a material scientist who wanted to understand the structure of bipyramidal uh, oxides of various, uh, of various compounds uh, and was maybe hoping that they would matter for electronic materials. And in fact, fundamental research on differential privacy, theoretical works, uh, 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 research on differential privacy has turned into something that is central to the way the US census is, uh, is conducting its work. In fact, differential privacy was one of the uh, MIT Technology Review big uh, 10 uh, technology breakthroughs of the year, 2020. Let me suggest you beware of false dichotomies between a piece of fundamental research and the translation innovation. This beautiful blue compound here, which came out from trying to understand these bipyramidal oxides, in fact, was, is the first new blue pigment invented in 200 years. And in fact, it's made a huge impact on the coloration in industry, in part because it has very, uh, very uh, good ultraviolet and near infrared properties. So it's important that we not decide something is going to live forever as one of the dance partners or one side of the uh, DNA chain. So Matt talked with all of our colleagues about examples of pure or use-inspired basic research and how it maps into translation innovation. Uh, and it was an embarrassment of riches. So I'm going to just mention a few of them. Work on the foundations of electronic markets, game theory, algorithms, systems, and also, uh, uh, also economics research funded by SBE led to the algorithms for kidney exchange. Note that that is a double-headed arrow. That's an important theme here. Things don't get thrown over the fence and stay there forever. They drive problems that come back the other way and the back and forth is very important. Studies of bacterial immunity led to CRISPR. Studies that our biology directorate funded. Structural biology, computer science, physics and engineering research in the 80s led to cryo-electron microscopy. Fundamental research in economics and in psychology spawned the field of behavioral economics, which is defining the way that many folks are approaching important societal problems now. And fundamental research in synth synthetic biology, directed evolution, uh, is uh, uh, actually led to synthetic pheromones. This last item of research is the research of Francis Arnold and uh, in addition to winning a Nobel Prize, she formed a company that can use synthetic pheromones for pest control. It's a very green way to control pests. Many of you will recognize a number of Nobel Prizes uh, in this list, 
but it doesn't have to be a Nobel Prize to have been dramatic, uh, dramatically effective translation innovation. So I asked the question earlier, how do we enhance the basic research strand, the basic research dance partner further as NSF grows and evolves? We use the flexibilities that we have at NSF. Let me mention a few. The flexibility to build capacity. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna have time to go through all the examples I have. And, and I'm going to suggest <clears throat> that as we begin our questions, a couple of my colleagues might want to mention uh, some things. For example, in the engineering director, they have a program called uh, Build, uh, I'm sorry, in EHR, they have a, a, a program called Building Capacity for STEM uh, Education Research, BCSER. Uh, I hope Karen will tell you a little bit about this. They are trying to build the capacity so people at institutions that haven't traditionally been able to do fundamental STEM education research can do it. <clears throat> SBE has a Build and Broaden program directed toward minority serving institutions. Of course, EPSCOR is a flagship capacity building program here at NSF. And data from our facilities often are available to people who aren't at major institutions. They can use those data to do cutting edge research despite not being at a research intensive institution. Um, I hope that Margaret Martinosi will tell you a little bit about the way they have instituted a computer science advanced placement exam that has had dramatic effects on capacity building. Culture, people, and risk taking is a way to structure, is to enhance the basic research strand. Um, I mentioned culture, people, and risk taking together because all of those things are important. You have to have the right culture, you have to have the right folks in order to take risks. Um, again, I'm not going to have time to talk about this example, but engineering has a program called Increasing Reviewer Risk Tolerance Through Awareness, in which they're trying to educate panelists in order to take more risk. And I, I hope Dawn will have time to tell you a little bit about that. Internally, we our program officers have flexibilities to take risk. That's much easier to do in an aspirational expanding environment. And we need to step up and do that. And we need to make it possible for the program officers on the front lines to do that. Strategic prioritization is another very important aspect. We are being driven by all the opportunities that bubble up from the community but we see other opportunities, opportunities that we have to balance, opportunities that have to do with our priorities, that have to do with the priorities of, uh, of, the, lead, uh, of the administration, that have to do with technological opportunities that emerge that can, that can make something a priority. Here's some current examples. We're still meeting all of our very broad goals, but things like climate change, quantum information science, artificial intelligence, the bioeconomy, advanced manufacturing, topics that resonate with what is on people's minds right now, but are drawn from a broad portfolio. I'd like to say, pick an important topic and NSF has been funding some research in that area. Finally, and this is a, a particular appeal I want to make to the National Science Board, we are messaging a range of audiences. OLPA has really stepped up to help us with our messaging to the public, to the research community, to Congress, to the White House, and you as members of the National Science Board, as we discussed earlier today, are particularly well positioned to carry messages to all of those constituencies. Surveys have shown that, for example, the public really lights up about dramatic discoveries. Uh, the response to the Event Horizon Telescope uh, uh, announcement last year is an example of that. The public resonated with that. Um, the, uh, the research community actually 
is more concerned about what are the directions we're going in? What are, what are the funding opportunities? Congress wants to see that the money they appropriate to us is advancing the priorities they think are important and is serving the nation, similarly for uh, the administration of the White House. So we have to do our messaging properly with all these different constituents, but we have a great story to tell. And we tell the right part of that story to the appropriate uh, audience. So I'm going to stop. I hope that we could start the questioning by very briefly hearing from Karen and Margaret about capacity building and Dawn about risk taking. And then I'll be very interested in your comments and we will all be happy to answer any questions you have. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing my slides so that I can see you. Great. Thank you. Thank you Fleming for an interesting presentation. Certainly the Curie and the Carver quadrants, uh, great idea. I think we should uh, work with those. Um, I'm hoping that the folks that you invited to speak can um, do so as we have questions come up. I, I hope that's what you were proposing. We don't have a lot of time. So I wanna start with a question from Artie unless his hand has been up from before. <clears throat> I, I just want to point out that we exist in a community of research supporters, and it's that community's strength that allows us to focus on uh, fundamental research. Uh, remember that agriculture, commerce, defense, energy, HHS, and justice all support, oh, and education all support research too. It's more applied than our research, uh, but that, that allows us to focus on fundamental research. We have a stake not only in our being healthy, uh, but those agencies as well. So, you know, one of the keys, it seems to me, to Maintaining that health is some of the is is some of the things I was talking about 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 capacity building, uh, and can can I ask Karen to briefly comment about that about that program that they have? Yeah, thanks, Fleming. Um, right. So in the education directorate, we recognized several years ago that. Um, as methodologies change very quickly and we borrow a lot from psychology, the social sciences, neuroscience, uh, statistics, um, that we, we need to support our community um, in a couple of ways. One of those ways is in, in uh, learning the, the most recent methodologies and, and really kind of taking the time to intensively study those. Um, another area, and this is, this is long in the history of STEM education research, is that we have folks who have PhDs in, you know, in the sciences, in engineering, and who want to then study the questions around learning and teaching, but they don't have the methodological background. And so for many years, we had been working on supporting such individuals at, at either early or mid-career. And this program has, uh, has solidified uh, uh, some of that ongoing support that we have been doing. And this is just a way that we have been growing our field and growing the capacity within our field. In addition to, as Fleming mentioned, supporting institutions who are trying to, to really step up the work that they're doing in STEM education research. So um, since, since I've briefly hijacked this, could I ask Margaret to tell you about this AP exam? I think it's an exciting story. Um, thanks, Fleming. Sure, I'm happy to jump in here. I think it's a great story about playing the long game, and it's also a great story about how different disciplines can contribute to this overall mission. Um, so about 10 years ago, it was noted that very few students overall took AP computer science exams, much fewer than AP calculus, AP statistics, and so forth. And also the diversity of those who took it was quite low. And so at that point, about 10 years ago, NSF size made a grant to the college board, the AP exam people, to encourage the development of a new and different APCS exam called APCS principles. And rather than in emphasizing coding directly, APCS principles emphasizes computational thinking and the broader foundational topics of our field. Um, at the same time, size funded researchers to develop curricula related to this exam, such as Berkeley's Beauty and Joy of Computing. Um, the new exam that we funded was launched in 2017 
it's shown huge increases in the number of test takers, but also in the diversity of test takers. And uh, the, the nice point of the story is that in December, I think it was the day of our uh, a recent NSB meeting, if I'm remembering right, the College Board released an assessment of the exam impact uh, as they assessed it over recent years. And the Washington Post picked up the story. Uh, some of the key tidbits are the students who take this exam, the APCS principal students, are more than three times as likely to major in computer science than similar students who didn't take it. So it's sort of cultivating and nurturing an interest in these topic areas by showing their foundational, the beauty and the joy aspect of it. And the differences are even larger for female and Hispanic students. And so it's both sort of cultivating interests at sort of foundational levels and also uh, showing enduring impact, um, particularly for a diverse set of test takers. Um, thanks. Thanks, Don. Th th thanks, uh, Margaret. Uh, okay, uh, Don, talk about uh, getting people to take risks. We can't hear you. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Great. So this is a pilot program in CMMI division in engineering, and it was originally called the Increasing Reviewer Risk Tolerance Through Awareness, or IRTA, but we've now changed it to the Game Changer Academies. So reviewers who go through this training will um, be able to understand, articulate, and address the benefits and challenges associated with funding high risk and high reward research, and the role of diversity in accomplishing innovation. They'll be trained on the common group dynamics, the pitfalls and solutions in the context of merit review discussions, and strategies for normalizing, valuing, and making effective use of conflict and disagreement as a beneficial tool in merit review discussions. The goal is to be able to reward innovation and transformative research by ameliorating some of these forms of cognitive bias. So the fellows that go through this program will anchor review panels for all programs in the division, committing to at least two panels per year. We'll put the program directors to through this training if they would be interested. And we hope that these fellows that go through this game-changing training will also become PIs and write risk-taking and transformational proposals to the division. So we're really looking forward to seeing the outcome of this pilot program. Okay, Suresh, I apologize, but I really wanted people to hear that. I'm glad you did. Both great programs, indeed. And, and Fleming, you, I hope you're following the chat where everyone loves your presentation. I think it's a great framing, indeed, like uh, Dario said and, and Steve Willard pointed out. I, I guess I have a question for you, and maybe it'll, you can um, flesh that out further. So you mentioned uh, the need to take more advantage of existing flexibilities to strengthen NSF's core research. Uh, what flexibilities are particularly important to NSF's well, research mission? And how does NSF intend to leverage those uh, as we respond to a changing s and landscape? Um, I, 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 the first half of that question I, I will answer because it's uh, culture and people and risk taking. The second half about how we leverage it is uh, I could speculate on and I think that uh, the director and others will have lots of thoughts about it as well. We can spend up to five percent of our make up to five percent of our awards without external review. That's how we do rapids and that sort of thing. Uh, in fact, across the foundation, some part some groups use those flexibilities much more than others. So one of the things we need to do is to have a discussion about how to use those flexibilities. But remember, our panels are advisory. The program officer gets the advice of the panel and listens to the discussion. And we want, I believe, one of our great opportunities, and in fact, this is something you mentioned in an earlier meeting, is for people to say, I've got a, you know, a, a good conservative proposal here, and I've got a really wild one, and geez, that's sure exciting. And I want people to feel like they can do that. As one of my colleagues pointed out, that's much easier to do when you feel like you are in an expansive environment, when you feel like there are future opportunities. I'm an optimist. I'm almost as much of an optimist as the director, and uh, which, which is a high bar. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think we're going to have those opportunities. And, and it's important that 
we embrace that flexibility. A program officer makes a recommendation to the division director who looks at it and all of the people in that chain need to say, yeah, let's go, let's take that chance. Uh, Fleming, I couldn't agree with you more and I assume you're calling on Punch to answer, but this thing about program officers taking uh, the authorities that they have, if you will, and I was almost gonna bring that up yesterday in the uh, Committee of Visitors and how to expand broader impacts and all that. I really think that program officers in those panel discussions have a lot of flexibility and, and I, I, some do and presumably others could do more and I, I agree with you entirely. But Punch, did you want to answer that second part? No, I think the, the, the you know, there are, one of the things I have noticed since coming to NSF is there are many, many great programs. You, uh, this is why I think hearing a few of them, even in this conversation is helpful. But what happens is these programs are at pilot stage. We need to be able to scale them. And so this is something that I'm emphasizing a lot. It is not that we are lacking in ideas. It is not that we are not listening to the community and shaping our programs to serve better. It's not that we are not willing to take risks. There are programs which exemplify all of these attributes and qualities, but we are not scaling them enough. And part of the conversation about scaling I've found is we are working in a zero sum game context. And therefore, how do you scale in a zero sum, zero sum game? Yes, we can sunset a few things. Yes, we can drop a few things here and there. But I am encouraging people not to be constrained by the zero sum game of thinking about scaling or innovating, but imagine that things were not zero sum games, how would we move forward? And so the moment you sort of break yourself out of the mold and think that way, guess what? At least my past experiences have shown that it, it is not a zero sum game anymore. And that's where the optimist in me comes out. And I hope you'll have to tolerate with that, uh, tolerate me for that, is that I'm muted myself. I'm optimistic that we will get to this future of this pie being much larger simply because of our ideas and the boldness with which we are willing to scale all of them also at the same time. So uh, th th that's what I would like to add to this. That's great, Punch. Thank you. And I, you know, at some point, it will also be good to understand what that prioritization means. Is it more big ideas or how does that, you know, that get translated? Um, we're done with time, but since Nick uh, has raised his hand, we'll go for a quick question and then we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, just a, a, a comment, uh, uh, both to uh, Fleming, great presentation, and, and obviously, Ponch, for the uh, environment you're trying to make, I just wanted to give you some historical perspective. Very, very similar presentation talking about Daniel Stokes, Louis Pas Pasteur's quadrant, was given in 2003 to the collection of the university-affiliated research centers, which do most of the DOD's work. And the big issue why they bought that up and showed this very similar presentation by the late John Summerer, who was a CTO for Johns Hopkins, was the issue of risk. And the issue was, was the DOD taking more risk and more risk with its UARCs and talking about this difference between both curiosity and use-inspired research. And so I'm just hearkened to hear that right now in 2021, um, we are taught having the same discussion and doing it and going forward and hopefully empowering our program officers to do the thing, to do the same thing because DOD back in 2003 had the same discussion because they weren't getting anywhere with the challenges they're facing. And I think under your leadership, Ponch, and with your leadership team with Fleming and the rest, uh, this is the kind of thing we've got to go forward and the message has got to be heard down in the organization. Thank you, Victor. And with that, let me thank everyone who spoke just now. Fleming, uh, <clears throat> great presentation. We'll move on to the uh, next one. At the December NSB meeting, uh, Erwin Gyanchandani, Senior Advisor for Translation, Innovation, and Partnerships in the Office of the Director, gave a high-level presentation on translation and innovation activities. Today, he's going to share more about NSF's translational impact portfolio and the future of the innovation ecosystem. Punch, again, I'll turn to you to introduce the presentation. No, thank you very much, Suresh. I mean, I'll keep it very brief. Uh, you know, this is a continuing uh, sort of context that I wanted to make sure that we get uh, the board to hear about where we are, and then again, seek inputs constantly, because it's not a one-time effort. It's a constantly evolutionary, evolutionary process, and then you're able to then bring the feedback that you all provide to help shape it and get it even better at how we are uh, framing this translation innovation partnership a focus in the, in the agency being given at a, a greater strength 
and so that's what we're trying to do here. So Irvin will give you a, give you a good, quick uh, view overview of where we are right now, and I'm happy to answer any questions along with Irvin uh, that you may have at the end of the presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm actually going to pick up right where Fleming left off. Uh, you heard him describe how NSF has a long history of supporting basic research, fostering discoveries and discoverers. And he added a third dimension to this graphic, calling out translation and innovation, spanning all facets of the basic research spectrum. In some sense, you can think of this dimension as NSF's role in fostering innovations and innovators. And so what I'd like to do today, as the director said, is provide a deeper dive into our portfolio that touches upon use inspired basic research leading to translational or societal impacts. And I'd like to describe a few of the lessons learned and then from there offer a vision of how NSF can enable the innovation ecosystem of tomorrow at scale. Some of you will recall this particular slide from the December NSB meeting. As a reminder, this is not this is intentionally not exhaustive, but it gives a sense for the breadth of our existing use inspired portfolio. The rows correspond to the different types of translational impacts that NSF funded research can have new startups and industries support for other agencies missions transforming how we all live in cities and communities developing the workforce of the future, among others. And the columns serve to illustrate some of our existing programs in support of these impacts. You can see where the green check boxes lie. Those are the points of intersection in this space. Based on the feedback in December, I'm going to take a few moments to step through just a few of the programs on this chart. I'm going to move fairly briskly, but would be happy to elaborate on these and other programs after the talk. And as I step through the slides, I'm also going to give you a sense of not just what we're doing within each of these programs today, but also the untapped capacity that exists in the community to further expand our portfolio going forward, as the director has talked about. Let me draw your attention to the top of this slide. You can see the different types of translational impacts from the previous slide. And so as I talk about a set of programs, you'll see specific types of impacts highlighted. So here are five programs that are highly connected with one another. The Industry University Cooperative Research Centers that Vic talked about yesterday uh, at, at some length, Transition to Practice, Partnerships for Innovation, the NSF Innovation Core or i -Core program, and our Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer programs. I'm going to illustrate briefly how these constitute one integrated strategic framework. There are others, but this is one for accelerating the translation of NSF research results into practice. So in particular, these programs allow the NSF research community to demonstrate initial results. In turn, PIs can then start to form partnerships with other stakeholders to start to translate those research results into practical settings. We provide education and training to our PIs and students about how to conduct the market research. And our PIs can then validate their results through new products, services, and solutions. So keep this framework in mind if you would, over the course of the next few slides. Many of you are familiar with NSF's IUCRC program. Here, NSF provides a relatively small investment, but more importantly, the structure that allows university researchers to partner with industry and other government agencies to motivate use-inspired research problems. Our IUCRC span nearly the entire breadth of the science and engineering that NSF supports, from life sciences to new materials designs to emerging sensing and analytics platforms. We invest about 20K in a planning grant that leads to an IUCRC, and then we step our IUCRCs through two phases now, trying to build in sustainability for the centers along the way. The return on investment is pretty clear. For every dollar that NSF invests, companies and other agencies contribute on average $7 towards specific pre-competitive research projects that align with their mission interests. And last year, we invested about $23 million in more than 73 centers and planning grants, yet we know that the capacity exists in the research community to support hundreds of additional centers. Now, as the research results start to emerge, there's the opportunity to begin hardening or maturing approaches so that they may be more widely used, perhaps by other academic researchers as well. 
the transition to practice or TTP offering, which we make available across a range of our programs, provides our PIs with additional funding to do just that. For example, you could imagine a research project that's focused on data rich visualizations that can inform the behaviors of individuals living in affordable housing so that they can be more energy conscious and thus save on their electricity bills. For that research to have consequential impact, we need to enable co-design and co-creation, bringing researchers together with housing development experts to allow piloting in living laboratories. TTP awards and supplements enable this sort of work. Last year, we invested anywhere between 150K and a million dollars per project, and the total investment across our portfolio was about $12 million. But we know that the programs that provide the TTP offering have investments of more than $500 million going back over the last several years. So a lot of untapped capacity there as well. Going one step further, the Partnerships for Innovation or PFI program offers researchers with prior NSF funded uh, research the opportunity to explicitly enter into partnerships, especially with industry. PFI supports additional prototyping, technology demonstration, scale up work, it also supports licensing of NSF-funded research outputs to industry. Each PFI project receives in the range of 250K to 550K, and last year we invested a little more than $20 million. Here also, a conservative estimate is that we have more than $500 million in projects going back over the last several years that are eligible for the PFI mechanism. Now, I think many of you are familiar with the i program, which we launched in 2011. A key objective here is to enable teams to conduct the customer discovery that they need to do, talking with at least 100 customers, partners, competitors, to reduce the time to translate promising ideas by understanding the product to market fitness. Over the years, we funded about eight nodes and 99 sites that provide training to teams uh, where each team is comprised of a technical lead, uh, often the researcher, an entrepreneurial lead, and a mentor. And we're currently evolving this structure, by the way, to a more integrated hubs model that will lead to a national innovation network around i -Corp. In this case, NSF provides each hub with about $15 million over several years to conduct the, the team's cohorts and the curriculum offerings. And each team receives about 50K to pay for the costs of going through the customer discovery activities. We fund between 200 and 250 teams a year. And last year, we invested in totality about $37 million in the i -Corps program. But the capacity exists for us to tap into thousands of teams each year, which would greatly accelerate the number of new startups uh, that are created as a result of this effort. And finally, SBIR and STTR. NSF created these programs, we often refer to them as America's Seed Fund, in 1972 to help small businesses, uh, largely from university labs, complete the transfer of their ideas into marketable products and services. You know some of the foremost SBIR graduates, Qualcomm, also the technology that underlies the LASIK eye surgery. A key goal of SBIR and STTR is to help teams de-risk their technologies and either bring them to market or get them to a stage where outside investors are willing to step in. SBIR and STTR teams step through three phases. 250K phase one awards are focused on feasibility research. Million dollar phase two awards enable prototype development and up to 500K phase two B matching awards allow for teams to partner with other funders. Last year, we invested nearly a quarter million dollars in the SBIR STTR projects but we received more than a billion dollars in requests. Now, I said at the outset that these programs are tightly integrated and together illustrate one strategic framework for how NSF funded research can have translational impacts. Let me give you an example. I'm going to tell you the story of NanoView Biosciences, which is a company that's based in Boston, Massachusetts. NanoView's breakthrough technology is the ability to rapidly measure up to four biomarkers on a single extracellular vesicle, which is a significant, significant advance that has the potential to help us understand how cells communicate with one another, for example, to facilitate the immune response. Now, the company has its roots in a career award to Salem Unlu, 
a distinguished professor of engineering today at Boston University. Salem joined the faculty of BU in 1992 and received his career award in 1996 for work on photo detectors and optical communication systems. His work evolved from there over the years and in 2011, he and his student David Friedman received a PFI award to begin prototyping their research results in the context of biological systems. In 2013, they completed training and customer discovery through the i program. In 2015, they received an SBIR Phase 1 award, 2018 SBIR Phase 2 award. Those were really focused on adapting that technology in the context of fluorescent biomarker detection. And they've just now completed a funding round raising $15 million and growing to 24 employees. Now, what I'm describing here is really just the tip of the iceberg. We have other investments across this table, across the columns of this table, and that aren't squeezed into this table as well, that we could discuss in much more depth if you'd like. Across this portfolio, NSF invests more than $500 million in all areas of science and engineering every year. And at the same time, as I've shown on the previous slides, we see the opportunity to tap into 10 times or more capacity in the research community through these existing mechanisms. But I also have to say that as we contemplate translation, innovation, and partnerships, that's really just the beginning. We see the potential to go much beyond our existing programs to unleash the priorities of the director, the administration, and Congress. And here's a bit of context on that front. Various national reports that have called upon the nation's scientific enterprise to really envision tomorrow's innovation ecosystem. Beyond the NSB Vision 2030 report, there's the recent report on the industries of tomorrow that speaks to the need for institutes that enable tight coupling of multiple sectors, rapid feedback, clear pathways to translate discoveries to practice. The Kavli Foundation has spoken to the unique opportunity that we have, the unique moment in time that we're in today to bring together significant philanthropic investment with government support for science. And there are several white papers out of the day one project that have described how to tackle today's science and technology challenges, we need to think about new organizational structures and vehicles and mechanisms. And these reports are being loudly echoed in the conversations that the director, Dario, and I have been having with colleagues in the private sector. We have consistently heard from them about the desire to roll up sleeves and work together to address some of the grand societal challenges that we face today, like climate and clean energy and transportation and others. These societal grand challenges offer an opportunity for industry to work with us, to partner with us, to pursue pre-competitive research. Likewise, we've heard of strong support for working together to nurture and train the talent base with a shared goal around diversity and inclusiveness. Karen and I, and with Dario's help as well, are already actively working on a partnership with industry to enable curricular innovation and research on learning in community colleges, which the board has talked about as a vast national resource that we need to tap into further. And finally, something that Dario often talks about actually, we are in an era where the STEM talent base is much more distributed than it's been before. And this includes industry, foundations, state and local governments and others. And so there's strong synergy among the folks we've talked with about trying to catalyze teams that really blend together the talent base in ways that we haven't done before. And by blended teams here, I'm talking about bringing together multiple disciplinary perspectives, multiple sector perspectives, researchers together with subject matter experts working specific challenge problems and so on. Now, when we take all of that together, the existing portfolios, our sense of the reports that are out there, the uh, 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 listening sessions that we've had, we see an opportunity to pursue what we're calling or imagining as innovation hubs or accelerators, really use-inspired convergent research institutes that would allow us to advance the frontiers in grand challenge areas. These accelerators would leverage the virtuous cycle of foundational and use-inspired research that the director and others have talked about, helping us to advance all parts of the basic research spectrum with an eye toward innovation and tech transfer. 
They would be longer term, larger scale beyond what we're able to do today with existing programs like the engineering research centers or the science and technology centers or related efforts. And they would cultivate public and private partnerships that would really integrate expertise from various sectors, motivating and enabling the research and solutions that we're trying to pursue. And perhaps most importantly, they would place an emphasis on diversity and inclusion as they work to educate the next generation workforce. Let me dive into this in three ways really quickly. Yesterday, Vic McCrary talked about the geography of innovation. Building on lessons that we've learned from programs like the AI Institutes and others that have intentionally brought together many different types of universities, these accelerators could serve to expand that geography of innovation. And to something that Roger Beachy said yesterday, we have an opportunity to align our investments in programs like STC, ERC, our MERSEX, IUCRC, and others with these sorts of innovation accelerators. We could imagine, for example, these accelerators as anchor points in a hub and spoke network that allows us to harness the talent, the work, and the outputs of our existing funding portfolio. And finally, these innovation accelerators could allow us to really bring new talent into the STEM ecosystem, like engaging with state and local leaders and civic oriented uh, groups and, and organizations. In many ways, these accelerators are highly scalable, offering the potential to inject two, five, 10 times as much activity into the ecosystem uh, going forward. So when you think about the innovation accelerators and you couple those with other programs that we're thinking about and conceptualizing, we feel this constitutes a tremendous opportunity to be able to scale our translation innovation portfolio at several times intensity over what we have today. And as the director has said, it's very much part of our DNA and very much core to the nation's long-term economic competitiveness. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention, and I welcome questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Erwin. Uh, great presentation. And um, I'll turn to the board members for questions. I have a quick one to start with if, uh, well, quick, I don't know. But NSF invests in translation efforts, um, you know, through programs in size and in engineering programs and industrial innovation and partnerships and so on, and in the convergence accelerator that you just mentioned. How do these different models of investment complement each other and you know, how they mitigate their uh, the risk, et cetera, are some more scalable than others? And I defer to scale a little differently from, I think, what you said just now. Um, the scale that you're referring to, my sense is you could do more of what you were saying, and, and there, are, there are good proposals to fund, et cetera. But I'm, I'm just wondering about the impact and reach, et cetera. So uh, could you address that? Sure, absolutely. It's a great question, Suresh. So, let me start with the first half of your question and then I'll come back to scale. So what I actually tried to show in this particular presentation, uh, if you think about that pinwheel that illustrated several different programs, there some of those programs are out of IIP, some of those programs are out of size, right? Part of my goal there is to really illustrate that we do have a tight coupling and you could imagine principal investigators who are deeply interested in trying to be able to take some of their research results and start to think about how they could translate them, how they could start to scale them and pilot them in various ways. And so when you think about that, these programs are tightly coupled in some facets and allow us to be able to enable that sort of pathway and sequencing. Now, in terms of, in terms of scale, uh, the second half of your question, I think it's, it's, it is indeed the case that we feel that there's more that we could do with our existing uh, programs, with our existing portfolio, just based off of the demand and the capacity that's, that's in the community. But we also feel that we have the opportunity to be able to take a different approach here through mechanisms like the innovation accelerators that could potentially bring together in an even more tightly coupled and coordinated way, some of our existing portfolios and investments. And think about how we could, we could, we could really bring into that a whole new set of researchers who maybe are not familiar with or really leveraging some of those existing programs and target them very specifically to grand challenge problems as I talked about. I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. 
Um, Rish, if I can add, um, you know, imagine yes. this as, you know, if, if you make an excellent point. There are many programs within, if you want to treat them as verticals around size or EHR or, or engineering or bio and so on. And how do you rapidly take that and contextualize it to all the directorates? So I, I've started to socialize this idea inside the, inside the agency. Uh, there are, these are verticals, but these programs actually are horizontals. Verticals are scientific excellence. Horizontals are how do you rapidly, you know, leverage the scientific excellence and also spread the scientific, the, the, the leverage, leveragement across the entire agency. So that way, you're, and, and by spreading, I don't mean exactly replicating the same thing. These are not replicants, but these are contextualized so that those directorates then can be able to bring out their innovations in ways that they can learn from each other. So you can think of them as verticals and horizontals in terms of how do you visualize that. And so to me, translation, innovation, partnership, some of these things are actually horizontals to the verticals that we yeah, have in terms yeah. of yeah, would that be great to see, take, and we'll get more updates, I'm sure, from Arun. Arun, could you um, stop sharing the screen and we'll turn to Roger for a question. That, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Suresh. This, this has been fantastic. I mean, uh, that's, uh, this, this presentation <laughs> resonates about as much as anything I've had. I've sort of seen from, from my perspective for the questions that we're asking ourselves about innovation. It's an excellent presentation, Arun, thank you. And thanks for thanks for starting this program with with, with Punch. Um, I have a couple of questions. The the, the idea that, that Punch just just talked about that is this is, is really horizontal. It's, it's not vertical. And and any solution at any any question is cross and multidisciplinary and and, and perhaps multi agency as well. While we've talked a lot about the importance of AI and and. Uh, and, and, and other methods of, of delivering energy and all the exciting things that we do at the NSF. We, we haven't done very much in this way in biology. And so I was really pleased to, to think about, I mean, I, I, it's exciting to think about this in the synthetic biology and biotechnology areas, all of which require a high knowledge, a heavy knowledge about structure and, and, uh, and integrations across physics and mathematics and biology and chemistry. And I mean, it's, it's all there. And, and, and yet we seldom are given the privilege of thinking so broadly in solution of just the scientific basic research and, and the opportunity for training for students. All, all that stuff is ex extremely exciting. So I have a couple of questions. These acceler innovation accelerators are, are to me really, really exciting. Uh, how, how do you, number first question is how do you imagine uh, and, and what level can we do you see engaging other mission agencies in, in what they do and in, in solving these things, because take the climate question, uh, whether it's transportation or it's it's uh, or or it's epidemiology or sustainability. I think it, of course, in, in the way of, of agriculture and food, and and with an agency like the USDA that has so little money for investment in fundamental science, there's so much that that you can imagine this agency stepping up to the plate and answering the the critical questions about sustainability of the food source or the health of soils or, or emissions that or emissions that, that are uh, greenhouse gas emissions that affect the climate at the other end. So th this whole thing about uh, looking at upstream effects that, that can cause the climate change that is so important to our, to our, to our livelihoods and living. And, and what it was show, it showed up there, uh, Erwin, on your one slide is that we have very few, I didn't see very many science, very many companies in the biology side, biological sciences on that slide of partnerships that you showed. Now, now many, maybe many of them are, are targeted towards biology. And I wonder if we've invested as much in that side of the cooperation as we need to, in order to really face the life challenge of where is our food gonna come from? Where is it gonna, how, it's not gonna be in, in vats that make beef, right? It's going to be in, in using the, the solutions that have come through us over the last 200 to 400 years, just making them better. So I'm curious about that side of the, of the work, but congratulations on getting this underway. I, I love it. So Roger, thanks so much for the feedback. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen, if that's okay, for just a moment, because I think there are a couple of slides here that are in the back in, in the backup that are very relevant. So first, Roger, to your point about engaging uh, the bio community and the life sciences, let me just give you one visual. Hopefully folks can see my screen at this point. I, I can no longer see anybody. So hopefully folks can see my screen. Yes. But 
this is just one rendering that shows if you look at the SBIR, STTR portfolio, the small businesses coming out of the research that uh, NSF supports, uh, in part, you can see that the life sciences sector is about a quarter of that portfolio. Roger. So I think that we are trying really hard to be sure that we're engaging the full breadth of the directorates that NSF has and the science and engineering communities that we support. Again, coming back to the director's comment about the horizontals and really trying to be able to use this as a horizontal that taps into each, into each discipline. Um, let me also uh, um, uh, go back to your first question then, Roger, about trying to engage the other uh, agencies. Uh, I think that that is music to our ears in terms of wanting to be sure that we are indeed collaborating with other agencies. And I'm going to give you an example borrowed from one of our programs, the AI Institutes program. So um, if you look at the AI Institutes program, these are, and I know it's a little bit hard to read, but these are the seven institutes that were funded in the first go around. And the reason I show this as an example is because it's illustrative of that spectrum from exploratory to translational or use inspired research. And when I look at these seven institutes that were funded in the first round, two were wholly funded by USDA NIFA, to your point, Roger. Uh, and in particular, let me, let me give you another uh, one of the institutes, not one of the ones that was funded by USDA NIFA, but just to talk about the level of engagement that we're seeing. So this was an institute around trustworthy AI systems. And the uh, PI team ended up focusing specifically on AI, trustworthy AI in the context of weather, climate, and coastal oceanography. Okay, you can see the set of universities that were involved, the primary institutions that were involved, uh, some diversity among those schools. You can see the state and local agencies that were involved as part of that uh, uh, award as well. And then you can see the industry collaborators as well as the federal collaborators. So this is an example of you know, there are direct partnerships that NSF can engage in, as we did with USDA NIFA, to help enable the AI Institutes program. Here's an example of a partnership that's catalyzed by the fact that we put out this call for AI Institutes. NOAA and Navy are both partnering on this particular activity because it's so germane to their mission interests. So I couldn't agree with you more, Roger, about the importance of uh, bringing in other agencies. And that's something that we're very deeply looking at uh, as we think about these innovation accelerators more generally going forward. Well, thank you. I was excited by um, that was a really nice graphic that, that I saw. I, I'm not sure where I first saw it, probably here at the NSB, but very encouraging about the breadth of, of scope of, of solutions. So yep. that, that's right on spot. Yeah, thanks, Erwin. Um, we are out of time and um, there are other questions, perhaps we can get them in the chat. I hope that's okay, uh, Victor and uh, Dan. And so I, uh, the, uh, the breakout room is available. Please come back at 1.15. We'll start with the missing millions effort, which I know a lot of us care a lot about and then discuss strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Erwin. Thank you. Okay, everyone, we're uh, streaming live again, so we'll be back a moment here.
Suresh, if you're back, we are recording live, so you continue when you're ready. I don't think he's back yet. Okay. Suresh, we're ready to go whenever you are. Great, thanks. There are a few people in the breakout room that let's just have some video show up here. Ellen, are we good to go, you think? We are we're recording in live. Okay. That's good. Great, I see. Um, well, excellent, welcome back. I will now hear from Assistant Director for the Directorate for Education and Human Resources, Karen Marangel, who will present an update on NSF's plans for reaching the missing but invisible millions. As you may recall, Karen gave a great presentation on this topic at our December meeting and before Karen begins again, I'll turn to uh, Punch for any starting comments. And thank you, Suresh. I think there's a continuing conversation, as I said in the previous, we are going to be engaging with the board, getting your feedback. Uh, this is exceedingly valuable to us and uh, as we shape our thinking. So thank you so much. Over to Karen. Thank you, Punch, and thank you, Suresh. And good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all again for the opportunity to update you on the work that we've been doing to address the missing millions. I want to thank my colleagues, my fellow assistant directors, as well as the leadership and staff of BFA and ODI and other offices around NSF. We have been working together since December to scope out NSF's unique contribution to the missing millions. At the last meeting, we discussed some of the challenges facing our goal of reaching the missing millions, what NSF has been doing to address these challenges, and I provided examples of programs from pre-K 12 through graduate levels, illustrating the breadth of activities we support. And earlier today on the panel, you heard mention of three of these programs, AGAP, LSAMP, and TCUP, and their importance in both impacting individuals and institutions. In December, we came out of that discussion with a desire to set more specific and measurable goals with associated metrics so that we can track our progress moving forward. Today, I wanna to update you on how we have been situating this work within NSF to use the range of tools available to us within the agency so that we take an all of NSF approach. I also want to situate NSF's work on the missing and invisible millions within the federal landscape. If we are to add diverse STEM talent on the order of 4 million individuals by 2030, we must have strong partnerships to deliver, as the director has talked about, at speed and scale. We are taking an all of NSF approach to set our internal goals for one year, five years, and 10 years. In order to set these goals, there is much to organize because we have extensive activities in this area. And what has consumed a lot of our time is taking stock of these activities and figuring out how to better organize them. We are re-examining our activities and strategically engaging with leaders and teams across NSF to focus on powerful solutions that NSF can contribute to this national priority. Our main levers at NSF to drive progress are through our funding mechanisms, policy development and policy development and refinement and knowledge management. So this effort brings together NSF's program leaders throughout the directorates with NSF leaders in management and oversight who are helping us scope out a whole of agency response to this grand challenge. In particular, we're working closely with Teresa Grankorvitz who, as you know, is both the performance improvement officer and the CFO, and who, as you heard, leads NSF, NSF's response to the OIG management challenges. And yesterday, Mark Bell updated you on those challenges, which includes the missing millions this year. We are also leveraging performance management tools, as well as the, ma the management challenge process and reporting mechanism to ensure that we meet this moment with strategic, creative, and results-driven thinking, exploring all of those levers that NSF can control and influence. On the timeline presented here, you can see our current activities 
coordinating our work internally and how this aligns with some of the milestone activities and the management challenges, which will be ready in the summer and fall of 2021. Finally, we are working in partnership with Janice, Steve, Jennifer, and Susie and others as we develop NSF's next strategic plan to ensure that the work we're undertaking on the missing millions is reflected in the strategic planning process. Again, we align our work with the timeline of the strategic plan, and you're going to hear more about that in just a few moments. NSF, however, does not act in isolation, and we must consider the broader federal landscape as we scope out NSF's unique contribution in filling, fulfilling the goals of reaching the missing millions. As you know, NSF co-leads the Committee on STEM which has, responsibility, which has responsibilities outlined in the America Competes Reauthorization Act. One of the major activities of the Committee on STEM was the publication of the federal five-year strategic plan for STEM education, which was published in late 2018, and through the NSTC subcommittee to the Committee on STEM and its five interagency working groups we have been implementing activities aligned with that strategic plan. In particular, the strategic plan outlines three goals, one of which represented here is to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM. And this goal is tightly aligned with NSB's Vision 2030 goal and the director's goal to reach the missing millions. Within this federal landscape, NSF takes a leadership role. 15 agencies and the Office of Science and Technology Policy work together on implementing the strategic plan. I want to draw your attention to two interagency working groups that are very important to NSF's work on the missing invisible millions. First, the interagency working group on inclusion in STEM is charged with undertaking a comprehensive review of broadening participation best practices, identifying exemplary programs across the federal government and bringing together an evidence base. This work is nearly completed. They are also making recommendations about how to increase diversity in the federal STEM workforce. That work has already yielded recommendations but will require changes to hiring authorities that are beyond the scope of CoSTEM. I also want to point out that Sylvia James, the Deputy Assistant Director of EHR, co-leads this important interagency working group. Next, the interagency working group on transparency and accountability is charged with developing common reporting metrics across federal agencies. Specifically, the reporting of participation rates of underrepresented groups in STEM, including Black, Hispanic, Native American, Native Alaskan, Pacific Islander, persons with disabilities, and those from rural communities. One of my senior advisors, Sarah K. McDonald, co-leads the work on this interagency working group. The metrics and measures that NSF ultimately uses to gauge progress on the missing millions should take into account how efforts are being measured across the federal government. The IWG is doing the painstaking work, and I have to emphasize that this is painstaking work, of canvassing the multiple measures in place and figuring out how to coordinate them. In particular, the IWG has already reviewed information reported by FC STEM agencies on designations of participant currently in use. And this refers to someone who participates in a grant funded program. Even within NSF, that, that definition of participant um, is buried uh, across the agency. So you can imagine what happens when we expand that to across the federal government. They have suggested an approach for designating reportable individuals and classifying participant types for reporting purposes. They prepared and submitted to FC STEM a compendium of definitions and designations of rural areas currently employed in the US federal statistical system, 
And again, there are many definitions out there and we are trying to coordinate and figure out ways to use those multiple definitions to make sense of the progress being made across the federal government. Figuring out the implications of implementing the proposed rural and participant designations uh, is being done by conducting a pilot study with 19 investments across 10 different agencies. And NSF is of course participating in that with several uh, different programs uh, across uh, a, a number of directorates. The group continues to drive toward understanding the shared priorities for implementing common metrics across federal agencies and the challenges associated with this. I also want to point out that shared measures work is taking place in other areas. The NSF includes national network is developing shared measures across the NSF includes network projects. These measures will be particularly important for understanding the ability of projects to scale their work quickly. And it's important that we take into consideration all of this metrics and measurement work as we reflect on how NSF will begin to show its progress. So I hope that this provided some insight into the work taking place both within NSF, coordinating across the various offices and directorates and the work happening across the federal landscape. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Karen. Your presentations are always wonderful. Um, I see Matt uh, Malkin's hand and uh, others with questions, please raise your hand as well. Thanks, Suresh, and thanks, Karen. This isn't even really a short question. It's kind of more of an action item. And I'm not sure about the protocols. Yeah, I'm a newbie here, but, but I just wanted to put this before the, the full board, something that I think is very, very important. I've been involved with this question about uh, retention and uh, missing millions for most of the time I've actually been at UCLA. And one of the things I've learn is that if we are really going to crack this problem, which we must, then one of the things that we've got to have is detailed individual data on students. Uh, and in particular, you have, you have to look at the, the, the movement of the students um, through the education system which means you have to know at an individual level, uh, I'm talking about anonymous data, of course, or we don't wanna have the names of the students, but you have to know at the individual level what the students um, come in with uh, from high school and then what happens to them in college. And then of course, we'd also like to know about graduates, but also. So the, the key here is you have to have uh, merged data sets or linked data sets between uh, what we know of the students in high school and what we know of them in college. And that is possible to do. In fact, the, the universities can do this. I think the closest thing that maybe we already have a little bit of access to that is, is through the Mellon Foundation. Actually, Suzanne mentioned that uh, in the very interesting discussion this morning. So I think this is so, of course, if someone tells me, Matt, you know, we already have a start on this data, that's great. Then we're that further along. But it, it, I feel so strongly about the importance of this that I'm actually, I want to volunteer uh, and, and work with, and I have not talked with, with Karen about this yet, uh, but I, I want to work with whoever would be interested in trying to assemble um, the, these detailed data from I don't know, maybe a dozen uh, representative colleges and universities that, you know, that, that sort of span the, 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 the array of the country. And so that's, that's my pitch. Um, I, I just, there, there's many critical questions we have to see about um, the students come into college from high school with many different preparations. Uh, and some have had uh, honors courses, some are doing calculus, some have AP calculus, some don't even have that opportunity, by the way, in their schools, but it's possible to, to, to catch up, and we really have to find out um, the mechanics of, of how this is done. Anyway, sorry, that's my pitch. Matt, I, I so appreciate your enthusiasm, and at, at any time, I would, I would love to talk with you about this. Just a, a couple of quick comments in response. Uh, over a decade ago, the U.S. Department of Education funded states to develop linked data systems to do exactly what you're describing. So to link that data from pre-K-12 
through to the workforce. And in some states, they did work with their state departments of labor and 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 have found these these very long data sets um, that do keep track of students. It's variable and it's difficult, as you might imagine. Um, you know, getting getting different data systems to talk to each other was a challenge in many states. But there are some states out there that that do have these up and running. Also, through the Department of Education, um, they have funded longitudinal uh, studies that that collect a more even more in depth data from students, surveys, um, more in depth kind of transcript analysis. They they really track and follow students from. Right now, the current one that is going on uh, started with them in middle school about a decade ago, so it has followed them post-college. So we do have some of these rich data sets, but uh, I agree with you that we need more emphasis on this. Um, in our communities at, at NSF, uh, we have been really trying to work to build up the data capacities and the cyber infrastructure in educational data that would do some of what you're talking about. So I'm thrilled to hear this. Please do know that there is work going on, but more work is necessary in this space. That, that's very encouraging. And Matt, that's the right thing to do. Always volunteer yourself. Things get done. So well done. <laughs> we'll go to Victor. Vic. Yeah, thank you, Suresh. And uh, Matt, uh, I'll call you out. Thank you for publicly volunteering. So that's even better. So I appreciate that. Uh, Karen, just a quick question. On your metrics, and you talked about participants, does that include research associates? I would need to check, Vic, but it should. And this is part of the, the complexity of defining participant. Uh, so what, what do we mean as, like, what, what are we classifying as a participant when we fund a grant? Uh, you know, if we fund a grant in astronomy versus in, you know, a grant that's taking place in a K-12 school, the participants are going to be quite different. So it should, um, it, it, you know, but I haven't, it, yeah, it should. <laughs> and that, I think you're illustrating exactly the complexity that we're dealing with. Yeah, if we can make clear in, on, the, on the different types, what are the participants? Getting back to what Matt just volunteered, it makes it easier now to not only know who is being affected as we start to make those metrics, but what are the demographics? You know, because the more we have better data, then we know what levers and buttons we can push, what incentives that we can put forward. But if you can quantify that for us and, and give that to us next time, that will be very helpful. Okay, yes. I, and thank you for recognizing the complexity of that work because it is, it, it, it is incredibly difficult. And then we have to go back to stakeholders and make sure that whatever we're agreeing on is working for the individual agencies within NSF, it's working for the individual directorates uh, because there are those unique features uh, that we're working within. Thanks, um, Karen. I, you know, I want to squeeze in one more question before we move on, and that is, uh, you know, I think it's a quick one, but what's one thing that is doable by NSF in the next year that would make a difference in the effort to reach the missing millions? Yeah, I, um, so I think the work that we're doing across, and this, this was an aha moment, uh, at least for me, and I think for several of our colleagues, um, as we align, uh, aligning the work across the foundation. I mean, what we realized since we started undertaking this was that there's so much going on. And it's very hard to organize all of this. And so this is why our partnership with Teresa and Rhonda and others has been vitally important because we are making use of the NSF mechanisms. So within a year, we will have goals set out and we will have metrics designed to be able to say, this is how we're doing and reaching those goals. And that's what's very exciting about what's taken place over the last couple of months. That's great. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you both to Punch and Karen. Um, as you know, we all love this topic and are watching and, and waiting to help. Um, it's great to see the thinking about levers across NSF and NSF's unique contributions and move towards goal setting. Uh, I guess at a, at a, over a variety of time horizons, uh, because some of these things will take longer. My colleagues and I uh, very much look forward to continuing to engage with you. Um, this, this is an effort that I think we just all love and is uh, a central part of the Vision 2030. So thank you for your work. Um, with that, I think I'll uh, move on to what I think is um, the central part of what the Committee on Strategy is about which is to look at uh, the strategic plan for NSF. So the, the preceding discussions have led us to the final item here, 
and as a reminder, uh, the board approves NSF NSF's uh, quadrennial strategic plan, and the committee on strategy makes recommendations to the board on that plan. One thing that's different about this next cycle is that we have the NSD vision uh, that we can use as a framework, which is, which is a nice thing to have. So the committee met recently with the group charged with leading the development of the next strategic plan, Steve Meacham, Janice Coughlin, Keister, and Jennifer Plose, um, who explained how the strategic plan is at the core of NSF's performance framework. We discussed how the plan can be both a communications tool and useful for setting longer term agency goals and objectives. We also encouraged NSF to draw on the case for urgency described in Vision 2030 to help underscore in the next plan, the importance to the nation of fundamental research and its broader impacts. Today, Steve, Jennifer and Janice will give us an update on progress to date and provide a brief overview of how the strategic plan connects with overall agency performance management. We also ask them to provide a written example outlining how NSF has used its performance framework to make improvements in the agency. Steve, Jennifer, and Janice kindly put together a one-page example on partnerships, which is again in the board book. I, I hope you've had a chance to look at it. After their presentation, we'll have a discussion about the strategic plans vision and goals. Um, we have a vision and goals that some of us felt are in need of perhaps energizing and, and reframing for the, next, uh, for the next phase. So I'll now turn to Susie Arcono, head of the Office of Integrative Activities, who will introduce the presentation. Susie, please, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Suresh, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you will indulge me, um, I would like to spend the next few minutes setting up the context for our mutual engagement and NSF strategic plan. Based on the director's presentation yesterday, focused on the aligned current administration pillars, your vision 2030, and his vision for NSF, we can imagine that collectively they comprise an excellent blueprint for NSF's future. As we all know, NSF takes the long view in its, in its investments. We take risks, meaning that we don't know today which of our investments is going to be transformational nor when. So we inspire bold ideas and then plan for the investments that will allow us to achieve them. Well, this is a complex multi-pronged affair. I want to present one illustration of how this works based on agency investments and priority areas and big ideas over the last 20 or so years. I have broken up this 20-ish year time frame into four chunks, what I am calling strategic investment arcs. So what you see here is a model investment arc of about five to 10 years. It combines three phases of work. The first phase is program planning and budget formulation. And then we execute. With most strategic investment areas, there is about three to five years of steady state of issuing solicitations and making awards. And then finally, we have the sunsetting period where we divest, move some programs into the core or evolve others into new programs. So let's look at this with examples of NSF programs. So this is the first arc that I'd like to focus on. It's the period from the late 1990s to the mid 2000s. During this period, NSF launched five cross-cutting priority areas. <clears throat> we also had a number of programs intending to digitalize and transform spheres of life, like the digital libraries program producing Google, which we heard about yesterday and again today. Another big concept born from this era was cyber infrastructure. The next start goes from the late 2000s to the mid 2010s. Out of the early investments in cyber infrastructure in the previous era came a proliferation of cyber programs in this era and in even a new office of cyber infrastructure. We were building the foundations for a data and computational rich world for science and society. 
The third historical era is the mid 2010s to the mid 2020s. This is the era of big ideas. Our scientists probe the universe in powerful new ways, detecting gravitational waves and capturing images of black holes, while others examine the future of work or built a national network of alliances with hundreds of partners focused on expanding STEM opportunities to everyone across the nation. During this pandemic year, we have lost over 500,000 lives in the US. Our social lives have been severely disrupted. Well, technically, we have somehow managed to survive online. And that is because of many of the earlier investments already mentioned, like NSFNet, digital libraries, and cyber infrastructure, to name just a few, setting the stage for lives lived virtually. At the same time, the gaps between the haves and have nots have become vividly clear. Today, we are critically aware of how much work we have to do to address the inequities that the pandemic has laid bare. And so we are poised for the future. The next 10 years or so, at this early stage, we can see some of it clearly the director has articulated an excellent blueprint for the future. He has talked about the DNA of exploration and translation, which we intend to strengthen at speed and scale. Flowing from this, we develop NSF strategic plans every four years. Out of the co-evolution of science and society flows the context and meaning of each strategic plan. Each one individually presents the science and engineering challenges we face and the opportunities that are before us in that era. It is truly very exciting to be developing the next strategic plan. And I would now like to turn it over to Steve Meacham and the strategic plan team who will give us an update. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. And uh, please bear with me while I put up the slides, there we go. So I'd like to thank Dr. Garamella and the committee for this opportunity to update you on the development of NSF strategic plan. Uh, our goals for today are to provide some of the context that informs the development of the strategic plan, which is based on stakeholder input and as Susie mentioned, the strategic investment era in which we're situated. Uh, to show you how the plan translates our mission into goals and objectives that drives ex NSF's execution of its mission. And to give you an update on our progress thus far in the pro process of developing the strategic plan. We also look forward to listening to your ideas about the vision and the strategic goals. The strategic plan is an opportunity for NSF to set goals and objectives that reflect the context, the challenges and the opportunities for research over the next five to 10 years. The board through its vision 2030 document has underlined the sense of urgency that the strategic plan needs to capture, as well as suggesting important objectives, including delivering the benefits of research and developing STEM talent for America. The director's vision of an agency that supports strengthening at speed and scale to advance the frontiers of research, ensure accessibility and inclusivity and secure global leadership provides an overarching strategic framework that aligns with the board's roadmap and administration priorities. A key part of the context that informs the strategic plan are national priorities such as enhancing public health, economic recovery and technological leadership, racial and gender equity, and climate change. Some of the key strategies that have been identified to enhance the benefits to society from NSF funded research include emphasizing the synergy between exploratory research and translation into impact, growing partnerships and fostering innovation. The NSF strategic plan illustrated here with a summary of our current strategic plan reflects the mission that comes from our organic act. The plan is intentionally cross-cutting. For example, there are no math and physical science directorate specific or EHR directorate specific objectives. The plan aligns directly with our mission, not with our budget accounts or our organizational structure. This separation was a conscious choice that NSF made in the 1990s after the passage of the Government Performance and Results Act. 
NSF chose to emphasize our cross-cutting ideas and synergies. For example, the integration of research and education or between discovery and societal impacts. Our strategic plans emphasize both intellectual merit, including promoting the progress of science and broader impacts, such as advancing the national health, prosperity and welfare, and securing the national defense. Both can be traced back through our goals to the mission itself. And if you look at our current strategic plan, for example, you will see that it makes the case that advancing the frontiers of knowledge and achieving societal benefits are inextricably linked and both are called out at the strategic goal level. The committee has expressed an interest in understanding how the strategic plan is translated into action. The strategic plan anchors a series of implementation level plans and efforts. These include our annual performance plan, which sets specific performance measures, such as budget and schedule execution for major research facilities projects, our human capital operating plan, and also the individual performance plans of our staff. Moreover, the management plan of every solicitation we issue explicitly ties the activity to one or more strategic goals. If we design the strategic plan well, it lays out the broad long-term outcomes the agency aspires to achieve as we implement our mission, both on a decadal or longer timescale in the case of the strategic goals and over the next five to 10 years in the strategic objectives. While a strategic plan discusses the current context for research and education and the way that shapes the objectives, it is not a forecast. As Susie has pointed out, new priorities, challenges and opportunities will arise in the lifetime of the next strategic plan, as they have during previous strategic plans. NSF strategic plan is intended to facilitate a nimble response as such things arise. For example, an emphasis on strengthening its speed and scale will position NSF to amplify the impact of its research investments as additional resources become available. As we develop the strategic plan, we're filling in a strategic framework shown here in a template form, using the inputs such as those described earlier and taking account of the challenges that confront us, such as climate change, the need for greater equity and inclusion, and an increasingly interconnected world with systemic changes in information flows, increased awareness of the threat of pandemics, and also the opportunities for new ways of learning and working. When we meet with you in May, we'll be able to share the initial draft of the new strategic framework. Accompanying each strategic objective is a narrative that describes a group of associated elements that, that indicate areas of emphasis needed to make progress on that objective. Some are associated with more than one objective. As an example, this slide shows some of the elements that were incorporated under just one of the strategic objectives in the 2018 strategic plan. They include partnerships with industry, reproducibility, inclusivity, international collaboration, as well as several others. In the narrative that accompanies the strategic framework, we weave many of the threads that you've heard already today in the presentations. For example, we stress the synergy between exploratory and translational research captured in the double helix metaphor, and the importance of creating a research culture of integrity and transparency that supports people to take risks and make bold steps. We reflect the work aimed at addressing the national priority of the missing millions that Karen described, and we take account of the changing context in which research is performed. For example, the acceleration of the pace of discovery that has been driven by increasing data and emerging technologies the demand for societal impact, and the opportunity to leverage partnerships that Erwin described. Turning now to our progress, hopefully this graphic of the timeline will be familiar to you from your December meeting. We've reached February and we're tracking well against the schedule we showed you in December. As the red line shows, we're in the development phase and we're meeting with you now as scheduled. We've begun the writing phase the writing team consists of the deputy assistant directors and the deputy office heads, and we're refining the goals and objectives, as well as beginning to, as well as having begun to develop a skeleton draft. We've also been collecting input from other stakeholders and receiving public comments on how the strategic plan should evolve. The director at his recent town hall for NSF staff launched a staff engagement on NSF's core values. So here's a little bit more detail on our planned engagement with you 
before we submit the initial draft to Office of Management and Budget this June. We met with the committee in early February and we're providing an update now. We're working to have a skeleton draft ready in late March for your feedback. Uh, a skeleton draft is a rough internal draft of the plan. The initial draft for the Office of Management and Budget will actually be a simpler subset of the skeleton draft containing the outline for the mission, the vision, the goals and the objectives, the topics that you're planning to discuss uh, in a few minutes. Then at the beginning of May, we will share the draft of the initial OMB submission with the committee in preparation for discussion at the May board, May board meeting. Since the 1990s, NSF strategic plans have formed a progression reflecting the evolving context in, context in which NSF, the nation, and the research community find themselves. At this point, Susie and I, and our colleagues Janif, Janice cochran pister and Jennifer Plosse, welcome any questions or comments that you have on what we've presented. Thank you. And thank you, Steve, um, Susie, that was great. Uh, I'd just like to briefly review the NSB's touch points that, <clears throat> that Steve mentioned in the process and the timeline. Obviously, we want to just make sure that we can provide meaningful engagement uh, at the right moments and, and not when things are fully baked, et cetera. And so I just want to check with all of you if there's any comment on uh, you know, the, the interaction and the touch points. So central to this is just separating out uh, you know, developing the overarching strategic plan, uh, strategic goals, strategic objectives from the board's oversight role of ensuring accountability towards those goals through the agency's annual performance cycle, which we'll need to discuss separately at a later date. So um, just any thoughts uh, quickly before we move on to the strategic plan, the next one uh, regarding those touch points? The committee has been working with Steve and his team closely and, you know, seems like they're, well, they've certainly, they've been very responsive um, and I'm satisfied, but I just want to make sure uh, if there are any other thoughts from the board. Okay, if not, um, I think that, that gives us a, a good amount of time for something that I, I think all of us want to weigh in on. So let's spend the remainder of our time discussing the top level vision and strategic goals in the current strategic plan, which is 2018 to 2022, and give Steve and the team input on how uh, they might be modified in the next plan to provide a compelling encapsulation of where the NSB and NSF want the agency to head. Um, I, I, Kathy, if you could, uh, post those in the chat, which you've already done. That's great. Um, it's nice to have them written out in front of you. They're also in tab 15 of the board book. Um, the current plan, a compilation of the vision goals, strategic objectives from the current and past strategic plans. So it's a, it's a great compilation that, that Steve and his team have provided, as well as President Biden's letter to the incoming science advisor. So it all gives us some context, and I hope you've had a chance to look at that. Thinking about Vision 2030, what we've heard today and in previous meetings about NSF strategic priorities and the new administration's priorities, how would you modify the current vision? Um, the, the vision says a nation that is the leader in global research innovation. Succinct. Um, I know Alan and Dan Reed and others have some thoughts about this. Uh, Alan uh, Stern, that is. And so let's talk about that. And then just the rest of it, I'd also like you to think about the strategic goals. There are three, again, they're in the chat. Expand knowledge in science, engineering, and learning. Advance the capability of the nation to meet current and future challenges and enhance NSF's performance of its mission. So turning it over to anyone who wants to comment. Well, um, I'll, um, since Suresh used uh, Alan and my names in vain, I'll explain what he was talking about. Um, in the uh, in the committee, we talked some um, uh, about how to craft a pithy message about what what the future would look like that would resonate more with the popular consciousness. 
um, you know, and, and how, if you will, not to speak geek to the popular uh, culture and, and uh, legislative leaders, but lands and taglines about what NSF does that matters that would, would get traction. Well, that was not meant to be a showstopper, sorry. Right. Alan, yeah, sorry. Alan Stern, if you've, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, just very briefly, um, I mentioned in a uh, committee meeting that I would like to see uh, that list include something to the effect of accelerating uh, the, the pace of scientific and technological advance. And I had sort of used a couple of corporate logos as examples. Maybe GE, given its current stock price challenges, might not be the best one to use. But the, we bring good things to life, you know, is a tagline that anybody, uh, you know, knows. And there are were, there were equivalents of that, you know, for multiple groups, profit, nonprofit, that sort of try to capture the essence of, of what the corporate uh, or organizational image. It was it was really that kind of context I met. Right, and, and Avis is we try harder than quite cut it as well. We'll go to Julia Phillips next and then Vic. Yeah, I think given so many of our, um, our conversations, um, one concept that wants to be captured is um, discovering, uh, you know, discovering how the world works and um, harnessing that knowledge for the benefit of society. I'm sure anything we say will be crafted into beautiful words by Steve and his team. So of course it will. Ideas out there. We'll go to Vic McCrary next and then Artie uh, Bienenstock. Uh, Julia just actually stole my thunder out, um, and very good. Thank you, Julia, because it was, we had this meeting with, uh, with the ADs with Ponch, and I think one of the things that kind of came out this, while we know what our mission is for NSF, um, I think for the person on the street, it's about, you know, we create new knowledge and we make a difference in people's lives. And that overall NSF is America's innovation engine. So I'll, I'll give that credit to Skip Lupia because he brought that up. But I think those type of conversations and being able to messaging is extremely important, not only as we think about future appropriations for the agency, but also not only how we attract talent for America, but how do we attract talent to the agency? Okay, that will be able to help us go forward with some of these objectives. Thank you, Vic. Uh, and Susie and your team, if, if certainly if you have any comments or thoughts back, you're welcome to speak up as well. Um, we'll go to Artie. Um, I have a recommendation you're probably not going to like, but I would change um, the world leader to a world leader in recognition that we now uh, are part of a worldwide endeavor. It's quite different from the way it was when I started out as a scientist. And we're going to have to share that leadership and we should leverage that sharing. That's so depressing, Artie, but <laughs> good point. Other thoughts? Yes, Julia, sorry. I didn't know if you, it was a second hand or the first hand. So go ahead. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, well, uh, I agree with Artie, but the other thing is something around capturing the talent and imagination of Americans. Yeah. I do want to put Punch on the spot, but I would I would invite Punch too to see if he um, feels like the strategic goal, strategic, sorry, the vision, you know, fits with his um, three-column thing and and all of that. Uh, so uh, 
if you want to speak now or if you want to think about it, uh, yeah. we'll go to no, Sanish Babu it's, after that. Uh, it's a summative uh, presentation of how you take those. Here we're talking about a global leader in research and innovation. That's good. But then uh, embedded in that is what Julia just said is, you know, embedded is advancement of ideas and talent. Uh, you know, and then the, uh, the concept that I'm listening to all of this, you know, these are all good ideas, but Alan talks about acceleration. This is a time to move fast. And so I think somewhere this convergence of acceleration, ideas, talent, and then positioning, which is the leader in global uh, research innovation. So I'm sort of crossing that, Suresh, as you're all speaking, to see what might be a distal version of that that reflects all of it. Because the tagline right now does not probably carry all of that. It is morally implicit. And for people like us, that implicitness is explicit, but for more pe more, more, most people outside, that implicitness is lost. So how do we be more explicit about what we think you know, we should be saying? So I will stop there. I don't want to have the tendency to give 15 minute lectures being a professor, so I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, Panch. Uh, so, and, and, and there have been some good uh, chat uh, elements coming through as well. Uh, so Dario Gill had a slight modification with the expand and accelerate and so on. Um, and Alan certainly wants to be the other than A. Uh, so Suresh uh, Babu, please next. Okay, so one of the things we heard from Celia in the meeting in the morning is accessibility. And that needs to be increased across the board, which aligns with the vision 2030 on the geography of innovation. If we can pull that in the front, it will be good. That's my only comment, I'll stop. And of course, you know, it's uh, when you, when you wordsmith it all into a small number of words, I mean, it does talk about advancing the capability, uh, one of the strategic goals of the nation to meet current and future challenges. And so perhaps the reach, or so there has to be something broader about advancing the capability. And that could capture some of what uh, Suresh, you were saying and, and what we've all been talking about. So um, ultimately how to reduce these into a very brief vision and or, or uh, yeah, vision and then the goals will be an interesting challenge. Um, other thoughts? Uh, Suresh, if you, if, you, if, you, if you will indulge, Amanda has something to say. Uh, of but, course. Yeah. Amanda, please chime Thanks, Panch. No, I just wanted to address what you had brought up, Suresh. You guys were talking about um, the messaging and how key that is. And I just wanted to make sure you knew, so Jennifer Plose, who's on the team, is actually in OLPA, and she's uh, been crucial to a lot of the strategic messaging we've been doing the last few years. So. I think that's a first for NSF and it's completely aligned, as you said, with the director's vision, the board's vision, and making sure that we can really turn this into a document that's not only useful internally, but that we can continue turning it into products externally. Yeah, Amanda, uh, couldn't agree more. And it's not only to be purists on our side, but uh, I think looking at the audiences and uh, certainly those that, that we're looking to, to double our funding, et cetera. I mean, what appeals to them while staying true, et cetera. I think all of this is, um, uh, is, is uh, part of the mix and that's the difficult balance to meet. Emilio, I'll just read out his, it's great. It's science and innovation for all Americans. Of course, maybe it's broader than Americans. So we'll think about that too. But Ellen, uh, our boss, who's on it? Oh, I kind of think, think myself as a herder, but okay. <laughs> hey, so I lost interconnect, internet connection and didn't hear the whole presentation. So it can be dangerous to speak after that. And um, uh, I didn't actually specifically hear the vision, but I had a question, I had a comment that related to the strategic goals. So hopefully you'll allow me to make it here. Um, there, there was three in, in the, well, there is three in the current NSF. Um, strategic plan and it looks like you might be headed in that same direction. And I was just gonna suggest potentially turning that three into four because I think it uh, aligns better with both Poncha's vision and with the um, NSB vision 2030. So when you look at the three today, one is expand knowledge, um, one is advance the capability of the nation to meet challenges and then one's about the performance. So keeping the first and last, uh, just a suggestion to think about, considering breaking that middle one into two um, and one so that highlights really delivering benefits and one that highlights uh, developing the workforce. And I think that just would elevate the pillars, 
that um, actually Ponch, both you and we as a board has talked about. So uh, just, just throwing that out to be considered. Yeah, and then that's great. And Kathy did repost the vision and uh, goals in the chat if you'd like to have them handy with you. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. Universities often think of three, a three-pronged mission, um, sort of learning, discovery, and engagement. And so, you know, there's a threesome here and threes are nice, but, but I think the four, the, the way to split it out is great too. There's, I assume there's nothing that keeps us two, three, goals, uh, um, a long list won't, won't be a great idea, but uh, it's certainly three or four sounds good. I feel like we should do a competition and send it out um, to, uh, you know, performers or something and ask them. <laughs> but uh, so Susie, go ahead, please. Well, I just wanted to respond to Ellen's comment that chairs are made with four legs. So I think that moving from three to four is probably not going to kill us. Um, but um, but I, I do want to say that when we do build out these large uh, goals over that are going to be important for many, many years, we do want them to be comprehensive. So when you look at them, you know who we are, what we do, what we're trying to achieve. It's a it's a complete set, right? And so I think you know moving to four to make it more complete. I think Ellen's point is right on. Um, is something for us to think about. I know the team is thinking about options right now for for what those might look like. And I think it is time for us to do some modernization of them. They haven't changed very much over uh, previous uh, strategic plans, so. I just love listening to your ideas. <clears throat> and just one more quick point. I really think that turning this into a document that is um, available to the public, to the lay people too, is absolutely crit critical. And uh, so I think we can, we can really work with that um, to make it accessible uh, to so many more than we have in the past. So thank you all for your comments. This is just really great. And if I could just add to that. Um... It's, it's great listening to your comments. Um, and I just want to hopefully make your, the task a little easier. Um, the vision and the strategic goals aren't the only words in the strategic plan. So when you have great ideas and great phrases, phrases if we don't capture them in, in the strategic goal because we don't want the goal to be a paragraph long, we can capture it elsewhere in one of the objectives. And also, um, if you think back to what you did with Vision 2030, one of the really nice things about Vision 2030 is, as well as the document itself, there is that two page summary that lists the, the key elements of the roadmap and the key elements of leadership. And we can certainly do something that like that with a strategic plan. And that would help us with our messaging to some, to some audiences as well. So there, there's lots of opportunity to capture your, your great ideas uh, so please don't hold back in sharing them with us now. Lastly, I just want to touch on this uh, three versus four. In the past, we have had four goals. And then in the last few cycles of strategic plan, uh, we've had three. We've had three for at least the past three, if not the past four. Um, we can certainly accommodate four. And as Susie mentioned, the writing team has, con has been considering options. And uh, yesterday we had a a meeting where we looked at th uh, three different options. One option had three goals and two of the options had four goals. So we're, we're right there with you. Great. Now I'm, I'm wondering, um, Ellen, if it's okay, I, I feel like, uh, you know, somebody on the board can send out the, just the vision and the three goals out to all the members again uh, by email and just maybe say by the end of the week, Friday or so, just any free associating thoughts and phrases that they want to send in might be useful um, just to give them a little more time to think about uh, a few more words. Um, Dario put up a document, I think it is. I couldn't quite open it for some reason. Um, it says network disconnect for some reason. But anyway, I, uh, hopefully you can, Dario, you might want to either reshare or put it as text in the chat or so. Okay, uh, I'll try to send that via email or something. Okay. Yeah. It, it, uh, others seem to have trouble opening it too. But um, other thoughts uh, for, I think this is the most fun part of um, what we do is just to kind of, kind of fun, come up with fun words and 
and let the NSF figure them out. So, um, but but it's a it's a great exercise, and I think we we're starting now for the 22-26 one, which is nice. So it gives us some time, um, Emilio. Well, I was wondering whether it was appropriate, uh, given that again we cannot talk about. Uh, you know, bird in the hand with the new proposed increase in science budgets. Uh, but if we are to think big, we want to make sure that the the new plan is thinking as big as possible so that it can accommodate and address uh, what we see as the needs that can be addressed if the pie gets bigger. So I think, I hope that that's part of the conversations going on within the a strategic plan writing group is uh, how can we make sure that if there is this you know remarkable increase in our investment in science that we can not just fund more proposals that are meritorious but that the the kinds of questions we are able to address uh, will be addressed promptly as opposed to waiting for the next strategic plan to be able to do so uh, so I just just a thought and Emilio, it's a great point. And I, I hope that the NSF team is not limiting itself to some budget and thinking broadly, but it, it's worth bringing up. Um, Stephen, anything? Um, yes, so you're, you're absolutely right. I think one of the things I tried to stress in the presentation, I know one of the things that Susie's mentioned is that we want the strategic plan to be able to accommodate a range of possible futures. And this has been a, a topic of discussion in the writing team, not only, um, uh, to be able to uh, expand to meet new challenges and new opportunities, but also to, to think about what that implies for our management goals and management objectives as well. And this, you know, the, the director has, has talked to you already about um, the importance to, that he would like to place on our ability to strengthen at speed and scale. And so the writing team is very conscious of that and we're trying to um, explore ways in which we can build that into any strategic plan. Thank you, Steve. If I can add, add one more thing, please understand that this, this, this writing team has to focus insanely on the 2030 vision and the NSF vision. And of course, contextualizing to the administration priorities in your administration, because the 2022-2026 is in that route. Therefore, that's how they're going to be focused. Therefore, to the, to the alternative uh, strategies that you will have to be broad enough, Emilio, excellent point, that it, it has to be. There's no other way, because if you're really serious about the 2030 focus and the NSF vision, it has to be brought. Yeah, I, I, I suppose it'd be too naked to have a fourth goal that says double our funding for, for science, but, but let's, uh, let's dream and, and broaden our scope, I think. I, I have no comment, but the NSP can do whatever <laughs> they want, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we're coming up on time. Of course, we've got another minute or two. There's, um, there's any other ideas, but I do hope you will check your email with these, just a very short email, right, with the vision and goals, and it might prompt you to think about a few more words, and then, um, Steve, I hope your team will mess with that and then share it back and we'll iterate and so on, so. Yes, thank you. We appreciate the input, and we look forward to coming back to you next month. Excellent, excellent. So I don't see any more questions or hands raised, Ellen, so I'll turn it back to you and I'll say that I'm giving you back two minutes unlike Dan Reed did yesterday. <laughs> Thank you very much, Suresh. And let me just add my thanks to Susie and Steve for your presentation, really appreciate it and excited about, uh, about uh, where the plan is headed. So we're heading into our longer break. Uh, it will last until 3.25 uh, Eastern time at which time we'll have an open session of the Committee on Awards and Facilities. So for board members, if you'll please take uh, just a few minutes to grab your lunch and uh, convene back in the coffee breakout room. For those who need help getting to the breakout room, I'll move you as soon as we get the streaming stop. Thank you.
Just so everybody knows, we are streaming live and we'll be starting here in about a minute and a half. Okay, so, uh, see, Ellen, if you're back on, we can start at any time. Okay, well, I'm uh, gonna turn it over to Dan for his committee. All right, thanks, Ellen. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, I'm Dan Reed, Chair of the Committee on Awards and Facilities. Um, welcome uh, to the open meeting of the ANF committee. Uh, the members of the committee include the committee's vice chair, uh, Carl Leinberger, uh, Artie Bienenstock, Aaron Dominguez, uh, our newest member, Matt Malkin, Julia Phillips, and Nelia Sargent, and Alan Stern. After we approve the prior minutes and discuss the schedule of upcoming contexts and action items, we hear an update on COVID-19 impacts on the US Antarctic program. But before we start with all that, I'd really like to acknowledge and say a huge thank you uh, to Executive Secretary Judy uh, Hayden uh, for her service to the ANF committee for the past couple of years. Uh, Judy has been detailed to position in the office of the director. We wish her well and we will miss her. Um, so thanks Judy for all that you have done. Um, turning to items of business, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the document in tab 17.1 of the board book. Um, in particular, NSF has provided the committee with a written update on the status of the transfer of the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory, uh, NSCL, at Michigan State to the Department of Energy. Uh, in 2016, the board approved the final O&M contract to NSCL, after which the facility operations would be transferred to DOE. And NSF reports that this trans, uh, transition is going well and according to plan. I just want to say a big thank you to Sean Jones and his team for providing the committee with this update. Now I'd like to turn to approval of prior meeting minutes. Uh, the minutes of the December open meeting are in the board book. Does anyone have any additions, deletions, or amendments? Hearing none, um, the minutes stand uh, as approved as presented. Uh, let's turn now to a couple of uh, of other items uh, in your board book, you'll find the rolling calendar year schedule of plan actions, context and information items. I wanna call your attention to a few notable items uh, that are upcoming in the May meeting. NSF will present a context item for rebaselining the, the Rubin Observatory due to COVID impacts. And at the August meeting, NSF will present a context item to rebaseline AIMS, that's the Arctic, uh, Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization Project, 
and present a summary of the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. So those are two upcoming context items. Are any questions or comments about those in the calendar? Okay. Um, so now I want to move on to an item uh, related to COVID-19 impacts on the U.S. Antarctic program. And I'd ask Bill Easterling and Stephanie Short uh, to give us an update. So Bill and Stephanie. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, I just want to start by, um, you know, singling out the remarkable performance of the uh, Antarctic um, infrastructure team and being able to salvage um, any of the season, uh, this past season, uh, down on the ice. Um, and uh, it, it was really a, a remarkable effort. Last, last July, we presented our plan for continuing operations at our Antarctic stations uh, to the NSB, placing the safety of our participants at the forefront Shortly after that meeting, we began a dramatically scaled back season that I just referred to that is now uh, drawing to a close. And I'm pleased to report that we have no indication that the virus reached any of our stations. Critical operational activities were completed and science continued uh, even under these very challenging circumstances. This photograph that you see up here, I believe it's up, um, is one example uh, showing the Adelie uh, penguin chicks during the colony no, survey. No, no, we, 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 not, we don't see yeah. anything now. Okay, yeah. Okay. I, I thought it might be coming. There it is. Okay. So those are the Adelie uh, chicks and uh, you know they, they seem to be okay. Uh, they're not uh, affected by the pandemic. So uh, that's good news to report. But I also have to share some unfortunate news uh, that we are expecting next season to again require a significant curtailment of activity. So allow me to introduce Ms. Stephanie Short, head of Antarctic Infrastructure and Logistics, who will provide additional details on this season's activities and future plans. Stephanie, if you would take over from here. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> If I could get the next slide, please. <clears throat> next slide, please. As Bill mentioned, um, we have safely deployed approximately 600 people, most of those through our gateway in New Zealand through essential worker exceptions to the closed border there. Deployers traveled to a US departure point where they began managed isolation, underwent health screenings and received an initial COVID test. After test results were in, usually two to three days later, cohorts were flown via dedicated charter flights to the gateway. There they were held in managed isolation for at least 14 days and received three additional COVID tests. After those initial 14 days, the wait for a favorable weather window began, which extended some deployers overall time in isolation to more than 40 days. When flights went southbound, stations observed a seven day period of masks and social distancing as an additional precaution. These were certainly deployments like no other. And I want to acknowledge the leadership team of our Antarctic support contractor who put the physical and mental well being of the participants at the forefront. I wanna also recognize retired Major General Tony German who joined NSF last summer and has built the close collaborative relationships with the New Zealand Ministries of Foreign Affairs and Health that have been so essential. Next slide, please. There was also a great deal of behind the scenes effort to support these deployers and the USAP season. Well in advance of the deployments I just described, our medical team under the leadership of Mr. John Fentress and Dr. Joyce Johnson rapidly deployed four testing machines and hundreds of test kits to our stations and gateways procured and shipped thousands of pieces of protective equipment and established a six bed isolation unit shown in the photograph in the upper left at McMurdo station for use in the event of a suspected case of the virus. All of this at a time of scarce resources across the nation. Deploying our small aircraft, which require multiple stops along the way for rest and refueling, was hampered by rapidly evolving international entry requirements or in some cases outright closures. 
The graphic on the lower left is an example of the just-in-time rerouting and problem solving that was led by OPP's Stuart Gregory and Gary James with assistance from our Air National Guard liaison, Major Rachel Lembach. In one case, deployment complications turned what would typically be an eight to nine day transit into a 36 day effort. And finally, a major unexpected challenge was the failure of our ice pier due to weather and environmental conditions. The expertise of OPP's operations manager, Ms. Margaret Knuth, gave us early warning that allowed the shift to an air bridge resupply, which is now ongoing. That's a photograph of the pier in January when it would typically have been supporting offload. Next slide, please. Through the operational challenges and lengthy deployment periods, perseverance paid off. We were able to supply the stations and meet our operational objectives, which included repair and replacement of critical utility and fire systems, delivery of nearly 500,000 gallons of fuel to South Pole Station, and crew turnovers. Shown here are photos of the South Pole Operations Traverse delivering the first of three loads of fuel to South Pole Station and a diver conducting inspection and maintenance of the McMurdo Station water intake. Next slide, please. Included among the deployers were 70 science and science support staff focused on projects where a break in a critical time series or data set would jeopardize the ability to test the hypothesis or those with instrumentation that would otherwise be lost. These photos show a few examples of the 20 science events with science deployers this year. An experienced student team was deployed to tag new seal births, allowing continuity of a multi-year time series. They successfully tagged more than 550 seals, well above their usual average. Penguin census work at Cape Crozier and Cape Royds was also successful. Benthic invertebrate sampling in the peninsula was completed. However, other planned cruises there had to be canceled because the level of risk in our Chilean gateway was too great. Equipment critical to Thwaites Glacier Project's time and melt, as well as the Polnet site in West Antarctica were dug out. And you can see here the snow accumulation from just one season. Instrumentation supporting the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and Joint Polar Satellite System ground stations were also serviced. Next slide, please. At South Pole Station, instrumentation at BICEP, Ice Cube, the South Pole Telescope, and the Atmospheric Research Observatory were all operated and maintained. Science support teams under the leadership of Ms. Jesse Crane and Mr. Tim McGovern, along with all of the Antarctic Sciences program officers, also worked with non-deployed PIs to identify and complete as much additional work as time permitted, which meant we were able to support more than two dozen additional science events with equipment monitoring, troubleshooting, and data retrieval. Next slide, please. So as we now begin transitioning to the winter tempo, we are also developing next season's plan. While cases in the US and Chile are starting to decrease, there are several factors indicating another limited set of activities. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the US State Department continue to have extensive and unprecedented travel advisories around the globe. Widespread vaccine availability in the US has been extended into the fall. And it is important to recognize that their efficacy is with respect to illness, which means even vaccinated individuals may be able to carry and transmit the virus. Emerging variants are now posing new challenges and increasing travel restrictions. International border closures are likely to continue well past the start of next season, again requiring exceptions for only critical workers. As a result, we are focusing on planning the work that is required to again protect instrumentation and infrastructure. I wanna note that we will be replacing the Palmer Pier as a critical construction activity. Doing so will take careful planning to ensure the safety of deployers, but forging ahead allows us to mitigate risk of failure of the pier, as well as avoid the significant disruption to the peninsula science community that shifting it at this late stage would entail. All other construction, including the Antarctic Infrastructure Modernization for Science Project is likely to be delayed until we are able to reassess the situation later this year. 
As we move forward, we will continue to monitor the situation very carefully and continue to consult with our medical advisors. Next slide, please. We will also be in frequent communication with the Antarctic science community and continue work working with them to implement off-ice assistance through the use of no-cost extensions, budget reallocation, and judicious use of supplements. We have been and will continue highlighting opportunities for data and sample reuse through dear colleague letters and periodic Antarctic science office hours. In fact, we held one of those sessions yesterday. And finally, we are working across the directorate on mitigating the impacts of COVID-19 on our community with some of the NSF wide initiatives you have already heard about. Next slide, please. I wanna end by recognizing the phenomenal job that the Antarctic Science Program officers did this year in interfacing with the community through many difficult conversations. And I also wanna share with you a few more photos of the hard work of the science support team. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take questions. And I have with me, Dr. Michael Jackson, acting section head for Antarctic Sciences. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Bill. Um, so um, questions or comments about um, this update? Well, I'll, um, sorry, Roger. Yes, please. Thank you very much for the update, Stephanie. Uh, given that one of our concerns over the last four or five or more years has been the stat state of the of the communications networks with Antarctica, is there anything that can be done in this break period or this downtime that could that could strengthen that side of the function, that function, that side of the function? Yes, in fact, now that our planning is uh, revealing that on ice construction will not be resuming next season like we had hoped, we are in fact working uh, within the directorate to identify uh, options and opportunities really for moving those kinds of capital investments forward uh, while we're in this on ice, off ice period. And so that's very much part of our plan and discussion. Uh, Suresh Karamala. Yeah, hi, uh, the great, great update, thank you. I was curious about a quite specific question and that is, of course, we've all experienced the um, very poor internet connectivity in, um, in Antarctica. And so given that we're all sort of uh, relying on remote connective connection now, um, you, you know, has that sort of hampered you in particular? And is there a plan to enhance that? Uh, are you focused more on greater bandwidth and trying to do some of this uh, given the COVID experience? Yes, absolutely. Um, we, as we've talked about in prior discussions, we do have a capital investment planning uh, process within uh, the directorate. Uh, those include not only the things like replacing the Palmer Pier that we have to do, but opportunities for really doing business uh, differently going forward. Um, these were these things were already on our minds, um, certainly before the pandemic hit, but it's made it all the more urgent for us to continue pursuing these options. And in fact, as we just mentioned, um, this off ice period is a great opportunity to move those efforts forward. Thanks. Um, any other questions or comments? All of us who've been uh, south know there are extraordinary challenges about supporting a research and scholarship there. And just a huge thank you to everyone uh, who's involved in, in making that happen. Um, much appreciated. All right, thank you. Um, uh, thanks all for the discussion. Um, thank you, Bill. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and uh, that uh, that's it for the open session of the Committee on Awards and Facilities. Uh, back to you, Ellen. Thanks very much, Dan. So we'll go directly uh, into the Committee on External Engagement. Jerry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this open session of the External Engagement Committee. I'm Jerry Richmond, Chair of the Committee. At this time, I'd like to ask Nadine Lim, to uh, staff liaison to the External Engagement Committee, to call the roll. Thanks, Jerry. Um, please say here when I say your name. Uh, Vice Chair Dario Gill. Suresh Babu. Here. Maureen Condich. Here. Kent Fox. Here. Heather Wilson. 
Okay, back to you, Jerry. Thanks, Nadine. So in addition to extraordinary Nadine, who you see is doing a lot of different things at once, she's extraordinarily important to us, as are Reba Bendapati and also Allison Gillespie, so a shout out to them. So first on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the December meeting. Uh, are there any changes suggested to the minutes? Uh, hearing no corrections, uh, the minutes are approved as presented. So uh, giving you an update on what we've been up to, uh, at the December meeting, we shared a number of engagement plans and recommendations to the board. I'd like to give you a quick update on these. One of the recommendations was that Ellen send a letter introducing NSV as a science and engineering resource to the 117th Congress. That letter went, it's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> December was just a couple of months ago. Uh, that uh, lives have changed. That letter went to all 50 delegations earlier this month and focused on the state and national level of science and engineering data on NSV's science and engineering indicators provide. We also highlighted the board's vision 2030 for the US s &E enterprise and offered to be a resource for members of Congress as we've talked a bit about today. 10 offices responded, many enthusiastically. Uh, for example, staff with the new member of the House Science Committee said she, quote, looks forward to working with all of us on all things science and engineering, and we are so there. Uh, and staff from Senator Kuhn's office appreciated the great resources and looped in multiple other members of team science on the senator's staff. Woohoo! Okay, so NSB staff have followed up with all of these offices and made them aware of our, our meeting today, especially the panel that we had this morning on roadblocks uh, to STEM graduate school, and they expressed interest in that uh, just yesterday or the day before. Another recommendation was to provide NSB members with a master slide deck and talking points for Vision 2030 so that all of us can easily customize and use it to engage with our respective networks. NSB's communication staff prepared and sent these to everyone in early February, and I hope that many of you, as Vix likes to say, spread the gospel and talk with your communities about ways we reach vision goals. We also said that we would develop a near-term congressional plan as well as media plan. Both of those are currently in draft form and the committee will review them over the coming months, over the coming weeks, sorry. For the congressional plan, high on the list are engaging with congressional committee leaders, including those of the House, Senate, uh, the High Science, Senate Commerce, and NSF's Appropriations Committees. We also want to engage with Armed Services Committee members, given NSF's critical foundational role in national security, and with the Congressional Black Caucus on addressing the missing millions in STEM. The Congressional Plan will be a living document that will give us target goals, but also remain flexible to adapt to changing circumstances. So our media plan will be centered around vision and indicators engagement and will include more opportunities for board members to uh, jump in and participate, including on op-eds and other media pieces in traditional and social media. I will note the several op-eds are either in development or planned and they will be co-authored by board member and NSF director Panchanathan. Now, once EE has reviewed both congressional and media plans, we will share them with the board. In December, we talked about engaging with university, government, and industry leaders in the states. Suresh Babu and Heather Wilson are both developing plans to do this in Tennessee and Texas, so I will now turn to them for a uh, brief update. And if Heather isn't here, uh, Nadine will jump in for her. So, Suresh. Thanks, Jerry. As I reported in December, the Vice President for Government uh, Relations and Advisory at UT has agreed to facilitate a listening session for dialogue between NSB members and Tennessee state policy uh, leaders. The goals will include learning about TN models uh, that could have more universal applications, such as the TN promise and exchanging ideas about how to overcome the hurdles uh, to develop STEM capable workforce in Tennessee and the nation. Uh, NSB staff are coordinating with the University of Tennessee Government Affairs Office to organize this event. And we will reach out to uh, Vision Implementation Working Group EE and other board members and the director of NSF as soon as we have a firm date and more details about this event. With that, I'll turn to probably to Heather or uh, uh, Nadine. Well, we can just check. I don't think Heather is able to join us. Anybody see her? Heather, are you there? No. Uh, no she, she, yeah, she, she gave us a heads up. She's uh, talking about multitasking. She got tapped to provide testimony down in Austin today. Uh, so. 
uh, we knew this might happen. Okay, so I'll just give a quick update on uh, what she's been working on. Um, she did hold an initial pl planning meeting and as a first step, she's aiming to convene a virtual session with about 20 academic leaders in the UT system to talk with board members about shared vision goals and ways to advance them. Uh, she also discussed the possibility of, at a later time, holding a session that would engage with Texas state policy and or industry leaders on the challenges and opportunities laid out in Vision 2030. She hopes to get the session with the UT system leaders scheduled this spring and will let board members and the director know when the specific date and parameters are set. And with that, back to Jerry. Great, thanks Nadine and also thanks to Resh. So we'd like now to see if there are any other board members that have feedback or additional thoughts to these plans that I have described. And Nadine will tell me if anybody's in the chat wants to put their hand up, anything at all. Not seeing any it's hands. Great, oh, it said after lunch, lol. Oh, wait, I spoke too oh. soon, Roger. Roger's waving. Oh, Ray, Roger. I couldn't find my yellow hand. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, so what's the time frame for getting this information? I, this is really stimulating some reminders to all of us about getting, uh, making arrangements with our, some in our states. What is the time frame for, for this material that Jerry talked about? Nadine, Reba, can you? Uh, are you talking about what, what both Suresh and Heather are planning or you're talking no, about the- No, the, the uh, materials that oh, the are materials. Being, uh, yeah, sort of. I think the intention is there to just, we wanted to make sure all of the entire board was equipped with a master slide deck and talking yeah, we, points yeah, that, have, yeah, have right, that. such that you can that, seize, right. yeah, seize opportunities as you, as, as they come along for you, like now Jerry, and going forward. I, sorry, I thought Jerry mentioned a couple of, uh, at least one other thing. Did, did I miss something, Jerry, or did I? Yeah, I think you were something? talking about I think you were talking about the congressional plan and the media plan. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, it would, Sorry. That, that would be helpful because of the state folks. I think our timeline is to have both of those to put before the external engagement committee sometime in the coming weeks because uh, they're in draft form. We just need to do a little more polishing and then you all will see them and be able to give us feedback so that we can move them along and, and implement them. Okay. Uh, I'll just note that the sooner the better. Yep. <laughs> Not that you don't have anything else to do. Uh, and then just for Suresh and, and uh, others, uh, it really is does help to jog our memory to get back. I mean, we do a couple of things and then drop off, and we have to keep going. So, Great. good reminder. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. Does anyone else want to ask a question or give us any more advice? I'll just note that the congressional plan had a little bit of hold until we the congressional committees had or have organized themselves and that's just finishing that process now and in fact they haven't gotten all the way through things like the subcommittee membership uh, on the on the uh, senate commerce committee hasn't been announced yet at least not as of yesterday so there's a few of those last things that we're waiting for before we finish the the, the plan to share with you all anything else all right, thanks. Okay, so before we end this session, I'd like to say a few words about our ongoing uh, external panels, uh, which I'm really very excited about how they've been going. And I must say that uh, Nadine, Reba, and Alexandra just put so much work into it. In fact, uh, in working with uh, Selena to be able to juggle her kids and also Alexandra's kids, we kind of had a pajama party the other night for a practice session and had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but so I, they've gone well beyond uh, any um, anything you might ask them to do. They're just so engaged in this. I can't thank them enough. They make me excited. And I think it's important. So uh, this morning's panel was the third we've had since our July meeting and a part of the series we've organized to inform in advance key vision goals, and particularly around growing our STEM talent and addressing the myths and millions in STEM. July's panel, uh, organized by Victor, focused on black experiences in science and engineering. December's panel addressed the impacts of COVID-19 on women in STEM, an impact that continues to be very serious. And this morning's looked at the roadblocks in STEM graduate school. Building on these panels, our May panel will highlight potential solutions to roadblocks in STEM graduate education by looking to the lessons of the minority serving institutions uh, to see what they can teach us and, uh, and the uh, HBCUs. 
Uh, Victor, we know you're moderating NSF's Distinguished Lecture tomorrow, which we're all going to be at on Black scientists and engineers at our nation's HBCUs. And not to put you on the spot, but we hope that you will host uh, NSV's May panel, panel and also help us with organizing it. We won't require you to come to a pajama party, as I promise. Anyway, Vic, I hope that's okay with you. Your timing is good, Jerry. He's on the phone and didn't hear what you just signed him up for. <laughs> All right, good. Okay, good. All right, we'll connect with him. Okay, lastly, I'll note that we've developed a list of potential vision-related panel topics and speakers for the future NSB meetings. The aim of these external panels is to raise awareness about and make headway in areas critical to the success of our country's science and engineering enterprise, particularly nurturing diverse talent and delivering research benefits to all Americans. So I want to uh, thank Heather, Ellen, and Vic, and others who have contributed ideas to our list. I'd like also to invite other board members, NSB, NSF, Congressional, and OSTP staff, and others in the SME community to suggest panel topics that they might consider for future meetings. Uh, you can easily uh, email your ideas to NSB's Communications Director, Nadine, for committee members' consideration. And we'd love to hear if you have any other ideas that you would like to share now. Any raised hands, maybe? I have this sun thing going on in my computer screen. I am not seeing raised hands. Well, I'd like to raise my hand. Uh, there's one thing that I've been thinking about, particularly as it pertains to this meeting, and that has to do with K through 12 education um, and ideas behind that, particularly, and in addition to thinking about how that affects disadvantaged groups. Those of you that have been on the board for a number of years, we had a phenomenal uh, board member, Deborah Ball, uh, from the University of Michigan, who is an expert in this area. And if we choose to go down that route, I would love to have her uh, in this very public invitation, which she's probably not listening to, I would love to have her help us with this because she's just extraordinary and could get, get us to think in new ways about how engaging K through 12 students in the science uh, arena. So that's the one thought that I have besides the recommendations that we've got. Any other comments? Okay. Well, thanks sign everyone. Oh. Jerry, yes. sign me up whatever way I can help. All right, thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Okay, thanks everyone. There being no future business, this open session to the External Engagement Committee is adjourned. And the time is, hmm, 12.56, or it is on the East Coast, it is then four o'clock, almost four o'clock. You're supposed to take the time. Yeah, what? Yeah, okay, we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, thanks to your committee and the committee staff. I really appreciate uh, all the ideas you have and the energy and enthusiasm and, uh, and the uh, panels have been wonderful. So keep up the great work. So we have a break now until 415 Eastern. And when we come back, we'll be reconvening in plenary closed session. So only those people who are designated for that closed session should stay in the meeting. Thanks, and we'll see everybody in a few minutes.
Okay, Ellen, we are started and recording. Let you ready to go whenever you are. Okay, thank you. Good evening. The plenary open session of the 471st meeting of the National Science Board is reconvening. I welcome back foundation staff, guests, and members of the public. Before we get into the agenda, I have a couple, couple of acknowledgements I'd like to make. First, a huge congratulations to Dario Gill for his promotion to senior vice president at IBM. He joins a very small elite cadre of executives at IBM and we're delighted um, that you serve with us and bring your years of experience and perspective from the private sector to our group. For those of you who do not know, this is Brad's last meeting in his role as executive secretary to the board. He's retiring later this spring to near Asheville, North Carolina, where he and his wife, Beth, are building a hilltop house complete with artist studio for her and woodworking, woodworking shop for Brad. As board chair and previously as vice chair, I've had the privilege to work with Brad during his four years at the NSB office. Among the many things Brad does is support my preparation for these meetings. He works tirelessly to make our meetings flawless and productive. Brad, we all thank you, and especially me. I'm also extremely grateful, uh, Brad, for your leadership of the office's policy team, where uh, Brad has had a hand in all of the major policy reports that the board has issued in the last four years, and he's guided and mentored our policy analysts. We're very fortunate that Brad chose the NSBO as the place to cap off his more than 40 years of service to this country as a military officer and a civil servant. To say it as Brad might, we've benefited because he has done and seen almost everything. As the brains to use that experience, tell it like it is, and even after decades of service, maintains a work ethic built on a farm full of passion and pride in doing things right. John has told me he hopes to coax Brad back as needed as an independent expert, and I'm certainly hoping he's successful. Brad, we wish you the best of luck in the future. Thank you very much, Ellen. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks to all on board who have made my, uh, my time here really, really enjoyable and rewarding. It's been an honor to serve you. The next item on our agenda is approval of prior minutes from the December plenary session. These are available in your diligent board book. Are there any corrections to these minutes? Hearing none, the minutes for the plenary stand approved as presented. I'd now like to give the floor to Ponch for remarks that he may have. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So I have very few things to add. In your board book, Amanda Greenwell has provided you with an information item on legislative and public affairs activities since the July board meeting. You also know that I share the OLPA reports periodically. As always, OLPA has kept us very connected with the administration, the Hill, our scientific community, and the public. I noted some of these in my remarks yesterday. The OLPA update also includes an appendix listing, the new Congre Congre Congress committees, and their new membership. Does anyone have any questions about the OLPA report? Hearing none, I will go to the senior executive updates. This is typically anybody who is division director and above uh, that, we, uh, that we talk about. So Dr. Peggy A. Hoyle began serving her SES career senior administrative service appointment as general counsel on January 3rd, 2021. Dr. Hoyle joined NSF in 2012 as deputy director general counsel Deputy General Counsel, after serving at the US Agency for International Development, providing legal support for the agency's science, technology, and innovation activities. Previously, she served at the Department of State, where she was attorney advisor for legislation and foreign assistance, and was later promoted to senior advisor for policy for the department's director of US foreign assistance. Dr. Hoyle received her PhD in political geography from the University of North Carolina. She earned her JD and Master of Laws in Foreign and International Law from Duke University School of Law. I'm simply thrilled 
to have Dr. Peggy Hoyle join as our general counsel. So I just wanted to make sure that we announced her. Peggy, if you're there, you could unmute so that yeah. people can see you. Yes, Peggy, thank you so much. Peggy is an awesome addition to the leadership team. For those of you, um, uh, you know, who know our, um, our retired um, general counsel, I mean, he did a phenomenal job. Dr. Tai Lo began serving his SES career senior executive service appointment again as deputy assistant director in the Directorate for Mathematical and Physical Sciences on January 17, 2021. Dr. Lowe previously served as deputy division director, division of mathematical sciences in the Directorate for Mathematical and Physical Science. Dr. Lowe joined NSF in 2004 as a program director and has served in leadership positions such as acting deputy assistant director, acting division director, and acting deputy division director in the Division of Mathematical Sciences. Dr. Lowe received his PhD in mathematics from Brandeis University. Tia, if you're there, if you could unmute yourself, we would like to welcome Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tia. Wonderful having you join us. I introduced Dr. Kendra Sharp at the last board meeting, but want to now recognize that she officially began serving her Intergovernmental Personal Act, IPA, assignment as the office head of the Office of International Science and Engineering on February 8, 2021. Dr. Sharp comes to the foundation from Oregon State University, where she served as Senior Advisor for Global Affairs, Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Development, and Professor of Mechanical Engineering in the School of Mechanical, Industrial, and Manufacturing Engineering. Dr. Sharp received her PhD in Theoretical and Applied Mechanics the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Sharp, if you're there, if you'll please unmute yourself so that we can recognize you again as having officially started. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. As a final announcement, last but not the least, as they would say, I am delighted, super delighted, to inform you that, that Dr. Margaret Martinosi our Assistant Director for the Science Directorate has been elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Congratulations, Margaret. That's a great accomplishment. You make us all very proud. Margaret, if you'll please unmute yourself so that people can congratulate you. Thanks very much, Ponch. Congratulations, Margaret. Congratulations, Margaret. And Madam Chair, that's all I have as announcements. Back to you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Punch. We'll now turn to the open committee reports. As these sessions were held in the presence of the full board, please provide just the highlights. Uh, First Committee on Strategy, Suresh Garamella. Thank you, Helen. Today's Committee on Strategy open meeting covered a number of topics, including NSF's current year budget, strengthening core research at NSF, NSF's translation and innovation activities, NSF's efforts to reach the missing millions and the agency's next strategic plan. And he looks forward to engaging again with NSF on the strategic plan next month. In the meantime, board members are encouraged to email any thoughts they have on how the strategic plan's vision and strategic goals could be modified in the next plan. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you. And next, the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy, Julia Phillips. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the Committee on National Science and Engineering Policy met in open session yesterday. Uh, we heard from NCSES staff about progress in the review of the draft thematic reports for indicators 2022, as well as uh, the plans for the continued evolution um, of the indicators printed strat statutory deliverable, the state of US science and engineering to be released on January 15th, 2022. The committee heard a report on the impacts of Indicators 2020 based on web analytics prepared by a AAAS fellow um, uh, intern in, in NCSES. Uh, the impact analysis demonstrated the importance of the various rollout events, particularly in January 22, 20, uh, in 2020, targeting NSB stakeholders and reflecting forward to January 2022 when the next issue is released. 
Uh, this um, included presenting a new short and high quality printed product as tangible reference to the information in the report um, that will be prepared by the board and the board office. The committee introduced um, a new infographic to be released after uh, this board meeting that shows unemployment data before and during the pandemic, comparing STEM and non-STEM degree as well as non-degree holders and showing the value of STEM, um, STEM jobs for employment, um, even in difficult economic times. The committee also reported progress on a couple of the policy products uh, that we are working on. Uh, first, on the theme of nurturing science and engineering talent, um, and that white paper discusses options for reducing financial barriers to undergraduate and graduate STEM education, particularly for students from the missing millions demographics, which we have been focusing on quite a lot during this meeting. And second, on economic, the economic contribution of international uh, workers, the draft uh, product explores both descriptive data from indicators as well as microdata analysis on foreign-born workers and innovation and their contributions to the U.S. science and engineering enterprise. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Julia. And next, the Committee on Oversight. Is uh, Anila Sargent on? Yes, I'm, I'm on the phone. Okay, <clears throat> the committee had a, had a full agenda yesterday, and I will summarize. The committee discussed and recommended the board approve two policies to improve aspects of NSF's merit review process. The policies are, one, requiring reviewer training in skills needed to provide high-quality peer reviews, and two, placing a broader impact set expert on each committee of visitors, the COV. Um, the Inspector General, um, Alison Lerner, um, backed up by Mark uh, Bell, who talked about recent audits, reviewed recent Office of Inspector General activities, and reintroduced Ken Chasen, uh, the new Deputy Director Inspector General, who, as well as being um, IG Counsel, will now be available to provide direction and oversight when Allison is taken up with her responsibilities um, um, with other Inspector Generals or Inspectors General. Um, the Chief Financial Officer, Teresa, Teresa Grancorvitz, presented an update on the work of her office and reported um, that the OIG ended its review on how NSF was handling the impacts of the pandemic on the agency's operations. The interviews and documents showed that the agency is actively working to evaluate and respond to risk and impacts of the pandemic. And this concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Anila. Uh, Committee on Awards and Facilities, Dan Reed. Thank you. Uh, during our open session, we heard an update on the U.S. Antarctic program. Full details uh, will be in the minutes. Um, that concludes my report. Thanks, Dan. And uh, finally, the Committee on External Engagement, Jerry Richmond. Thank you. During the External Engagement Committee, we gave updates on engagement initiatives, including we have a draft con congressional and media plans that we'll share in the coming weeks. And we also had updates on Heather Wilson and Suresh's Babu's plans for vision-related events in Tennessee and also Texas. We also shared our plans for the May meetings external panel and invited board members and others to suggest additional topics for future panels that inform and advance vision priorities. And lastly, I'd like to give a huge shout out to the NSB staff who worked with me to orchestrate this morning's terrific uh, panel. Alexandra Sircell, Nadine Lynn, Portia Flowers, and Reba Bentapati, you rock. So thank you. And that concludes my summary report. Thank you very much, Jerry. Our last agenda item is the approval of the pair of statements and resolutions recommended to the board by the Committee on Oversight, as Anila just mentioned. These can all be found in your diligent board book and they were discussed during yesterday's Oversight Committee session. So as a reminder, we're voting on two proposed policies that the Committee on Oversight and Cognizant NSF staff think are likely to improve 
specific aspects of NSF's merit review process. The resolutions before us are not about changing broader impacts, which is established by law and implemented by both board and foundation policy, but about making merit review work well. The two explanatory statements in the board describe the goals and rationale. In both of these resolutions, we took pains to give Punch sufficient latitude to implement them. If after a year they aren't working or, or doing what we hoped, we'll reevaluate or discontinue. So these two uh, uh, statements and resolutions, one would require reviewer training in skills needed to provide high quality reviews. And the second one is to enhance the ability of the committees on visitors to uh, committees of visitors to assess and help improve the review process as they do their retrospective review by placing a broader impacts expert on each uh, committee of visitors. So for each, we will address first the statement and then the resolution. So you'll hear four separate things. Okay, the first is the board's statement on training to improve peer review and address unconscious bias in the merit review process. Do I hear a motion to approve this, the uh, NSB statement on training to improve peer reviewing and address unconscious biases in the merit review process? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. There is a motion on the floor to approve the NSB statement on peer review training as presented. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. The motion passes and the NSB statement is approved. Next is the resolution. I believe we had one opposed. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sure. sorry. I saw, I saw a hand go up. Um, I didn't hear that. Or, are, are, are there no. any opposed? Hearing none, I guess it was just an errant hand. Apologies for interrupting. That's all right, thank you. So next is the related resolution, uh, training to improve peer reviewing in the merit review process. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. And Brad will now read the full text of the resolution. Resolution National Science Board trained to improve peer reviewing and merit review process. <clears throat> Whereas the National Science Board has made a statement regarding the expected benefits to the National Science Foundation's merit review process by preparing reviewers to fulfill their critical role in meeting the high standards of the expectations of this process, NSB-2021-8. It is resolved that the director at his discretion shall implement policies to maximize reviewers preparedness to fulfill the role in the merit review process, such as through a program of required training for reviewers and report back to the board with an evaluation of the policies within 12 months. With a motion and second on the floor to approve the resolution training to improve peer reviewing in the merit review process as presented. Is there any further discussion? Okay, the motion before the board is to approve the resolution as read. Will all board members please ensure your audio is not muted? And all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Nay. Are there any abstentions? Okay, the motion is carried. Does anyone wish a roll call vote? Okay, we are gonna move on and our next vote, and again, there's a statement and then a resolution. Um, and this is in support of broader impact experts serving on the committees of visitors. So do I hear a motion to approve the NSB statement in support of broader impacts experts to serve on committee of visitors? So moved. So second. 
There's a motion on the floor to approve the NSB statement in support of broader impacts experts serving on committees of visitors as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. I'm opposed. Thank you. The motion passes and the NSB statement in support of broader impacts experts to serve on committees of visitors is approved. And then finally, we come to the associated resolution for broader impacts experts to serve on the committee of visitors. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. Second. Thank you. And Brad will now read the full text of the resolution. Resolution National Science Board broader impacts experts to serve on committees of visitors. Whereas the National Science Board has issued a statement regarding the expected benefits to the merit review process from inclusion of one or more experts on broader impacts on the committee of visitor panels, NSB 2021-9, therefore be it resolved that the director shall at his discretion develop a plan to ensure that there is appropriate broader impacts expertise on COV panels and report back to the board evaluating impacts of the policy within 12 months. With a motion and second on the floor to approve the resolution, broader impacts experts to serve on committees of visitors as presented. Is there any discussion? The motion before the board is to approve the resolution as read. Will all board members ensure your audio is not muted? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Nay. Are there any abstentions? Motion carries. Is there anyone who wishes a roll call vote? Thank you for your efficient handling of these votes. Uh, these documents represent a step forward that we have talked about for a while in both the Committee on Oversights and the board's work on merit review and broader impacts. So I wanna thank Anila, the Committee uh, on Oversight, Committee staff and NSF led by Susie Iacono for really working as a partnership uh, to bring these across the finish line and for their commitment to bettering peer review at the National Science Foundation. As we come to the close of this meeting, I wanna thank everyone for your attendance and participation. A special thank you to the external panel this morning on roadblocks to retention of STEM grad students and to the collection of interesting and informative presentations by NSF. As always, a big thank you to the board office team led by John Basie. Elise Lipkowitz and Chris Blair will be picking up the baton from Brad Gutierrez for the May meeting. And I know the three of them have been working hard to ensure the transition will be as seamless as possible. Is there any other business we need to address before we adjourn? Hearing none, I now adjourn this 471st meeting of the National Science Board. Great job, Ellen. Great Thank job, you. Ellen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Awesome Good meeting. Well Good job, everybody. Well Thanks, all. Thanks, 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 See you in May. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. Great job. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.